Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us here for day two of the NISI Conference 2020. It's a pleasure to have you here. Some of you will be joining us for the second time and were already with us to yesterday. And for those of you who are joining this morning, a warm welcome to you, and I hope that you enjoy your day as much as those who were with us yesterday. Yesterday, the talks were focused very much about the role, impact, and power of arts, culture, and education, and how to avoid wasting the opportunities that this crisis is currently offering us within the civic educational world. For today, shortly at 10 o'clock, the first talk will be starting, and the focus this time will be on the European Green Deal and justice. There'll be representatives from the Clean Energy Wire, the Anglophone Africa, and also the German Development Institute to provide different insights and perspectives on this topic for us. That will be facilitated by my colleague, Dirk, who will be joining us shortly. Today will be a very full day. We have such a diverse selection of talks and workshops, panels, discourses to offer you. At 11.15, the first of three parallel sessions will begin and there is a selection of six talks or workshops that you could attend. I'd like to give you just a very brief overview and a glimpse into the content of these topics. They are all based on deepening and building on the three NISI thematic clusters, redefining citizenship education, restarting Europe, and rethinking the world. That will sound familiar to those of you who've been attending any of the events during the campus. For the first parallel sessions, uh, session, talk, session number one will be looking at the similarities and the differences between the COVID-19 crisis and climate change in general. The second session is going to be focusing on the changing role of China in world politics. Our third session is focusing very much on youth work and diverse target groups within Europe. What does national identity mean? This is the content for this talk uh, session number four, and creative approaches to new democracy will be in session number five. The final session, or the last of the six sessions, has the focus of what is the reality of so-called civic deserts within Europe. So as you can see, it is a broad range of topics, and I'm sure that everybody will find something that captures their interest. The rest of the day will also be offering a, a multitude of perspectives. And there will be three sessions where we have the example to hear real examples of what citizenship education in action actually looks like. After all of the parallel sessions, there will be projects directly um, presenting their own work um, in a very concise form, so please do check the um, program agenda and ensure that you don't miss those. And to close the day, we're going to be focusing entirely on the Youth Democracy Award, which was introduced yesterday, and we're going to be um, turning to the winners of this award. This is a marvelous project, so please keep a little energy for the end of the day and join us on that. I'd like to say a couple of words to the technology that we're going to be using today. All registered users have received any login information they require per email. If you would still like to register for the conference, simply go to www.nisi.eu and you have the opportunity to register. The technology we're using today is going to be a combination. We're going to be using live stream links where you simply need to click the link and then you can observe what's happening and also have the opportunity to enter questions that will then be directed to any panel discussion members. We're going to be using Zoom links. These are the video conferencing links you need to be able to engage during the sessions, uh, to see the speakers live, to be represented per video live yourself. You can turn your camera on or turn your camera off, but you will be part of the call. And we're going to very much be focusing on using House Space, the NISI platform that we have used throughout the entire conference, to interact, connect, and use as a depository of all information and content of the talks that have taken place throughout the entire campus since June. 
on Housebase, you have the opportunity to use chat boxes, to participate in polls, and to generally be very present during the sessions that are ongoing. So please take a moment, sign up to Housebase. Uh, again, if you go to our webpage, www nisi.eu, you can register and you will receive all the information you need on how to get to Housebase. If you're already registered and you have any questions, there is a Q&A box on the top menu along the top of the screen. Simply drop your questions into the box and we will be supporting you as soon as we can to help you enjoy the rest of your day here. Just so that you know, uh, those of you who were here yesterday, uh, I'm sure already noticed that we have a graphic recording for some of the sessions. Uh, we'll be able to actually show you some of this, uh, some of the recordings a little later. And um, for many of the sessions today, we'll also have graf a graphic recorder present. So keep an eye out. You will notice it on your screen if that is the case. The topic that I'd like to close with for this short introduction is the topic of evaluation. Those of you who've attended a NISI conference in the past are well aware of the importance of learning what is working for people, what is not working, what can be changed, and how to engage with uh, participants and the whole community better. So there will indeed be, as in previous years, a questionnaire focusing on the evaluation of the conference. What I'd like to mention is that uh, Julia Pfinder who um, attended the conference last year and was present at a market stand, some of you may recall. She was holding short interviews with people to capture your insights and your impressions of how you were experiencing the conference. As we're not in a live format this year, we're going to be doing this per house space. This means that Julia Pfinder is there on house space if you go to the Connect page, you will be able to find her very easily and have her contact details. She would greatly welcome any of you who would like to share your thoughts and insights with her. And in general, she is also going to be reaching out to a couple of people to gain broad impressions of what the sessions, how they are experiencing the sessions, and in general, how have they experienced the entire NISI digital conference? So please don't be surprised if uh, Julia reaches out to you. Uh, she would simply love to hear your voice. So feel free to speak up. So I think that this pretty much wraps up our introduction for this morning. And we're going to be moving on. I'm about to welcome my colleague Dirk to the stage because we're going to be moving into our first session for the European Green Deal and Global Justice. Good morning. Good morning, Tanya. Yes. So, how far are we? Do we have Zoom links to we link have into? We are set to start at 10. Do we have a short break or do we start right away? Okay. Do we, do we want to just log in um, and say a good morning to the people who are on the screen? Yep. Can we start? Okay, great, and welcome very much from my side as well to, uh, to all the o audience uh, across Europe. And uh, Tanya, you've provided a really good overview about what's happening today and also how it connects to yesterday. Yesterday, we started off uh, hearing a little bit about all the lessons that we can learn as civic society in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of how how to use actually also the dynamics that such a pandemic actually creates, especially the role that arts and culture plays in this as well. Uh, it came around very quickly that it was really about creating protected spaces for civic society to actually take agency and uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, to uh, and, and, and to fill those spaces there as well. We've heard from Maya Gopal and von Grace um, again about agency and the way of how important it is for the people to be really in. It's a part of co-creation, give people perspective and give people a purpose in this uh, around as well. So today the main focus will be about the European Union's Green Deal and the impacts and consequences uh, for, for the rest of the world, especially from a Global South perspective. We've invited three very interesting speakers from uh, providing various perspectives. Let me introduce them. The first one is uh, Professor Imme Scholz. Uh, Imme Scholz is the Deputy Chairwoman of the German Council for Sustainable Development and the Acting Director of the German Development Institute, sitting in Bonn. We have Rukia Kamis from Kenya, 
Rukia is a climate and social activist representing 350.org and uh, she's organizing grassroots communities in the Anglophone African countries. And on top of that, she's very, very passionate about water conservation and mitigation of water-related conflicts. And finally, we have Sven Egenter joining us from Berlin. He's setting up the Clean Energy Wire and Klimafakten.de, a foundation-based uh, outfit that is really focusing and providing uh, information on energy transition and makes it very available to journalists and the broader public. Uh, Sven has a long career in journalism across Europe. Very welcome. Do we see Rukia already as well or she's... I can't... Now we see her. Hello Rukia, welcome to Kenya. Yeah. The format of our talk will be that uh, Emma Scholz will provide a short overview, share her insights into the European uh, Green New Deal. And, uh, and then we would get a perspective from Rukia, how is it being perceived from the Global South? Yeah, how does somebody from Africa look at it and, uh, and, and how real is this really? Is this just one more initiative or is that something which is really tangible and promising from your side? And then finally we would hear also the comments from uh, Sven Egenter in terms of what does it also mean for, from a general public perspective? How can we actually take this forward and create stories and strong narratives around it there in providing the facts but also also reaching people uh, to make this really meaningful. Like yesterday, we will be using Slido on the main webpage in terms of collecting your questions and comments around it there. So please feel fr uh, free to share them as soon as possible around them and then we will have them uh, directed to the relevant person or actually get three perspectives on the same question uh, as you post them around. I'm looking forward to a really interesting debate and uh, may I pass it over to Emma Scholz to share your insights and your perspectives on Europe's, uh, the European Union's uh, deal. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dirk. I hope you can hear me well. So, um, yes, the European Green Deal was announced by the uh, Commission at the Climate COP in, uh, at the end of last year in Madrid. And I think the excitement then was great because it was very uh, clear on how to uh, um, ramp up the EU's ambition regarding emission reductions and achieving a climate neutrality by 2050, but also because it went a step further and didn't focus only on climate neutrality, but it included um, other uh, uh, um, uh, goals for reducing uh, negative environmental trends in the EU. So it, will in, it wants to invest in circular economy, so to re uh, decouple economic activity or economic growth from resource use. It wants to do more for biodiversity uh, protection and is in, in particular to reduce um, the environmental harms connected with um, agriculture and food consumption. Uh, so so that it, it, it sounded uh, somehow convincing as a European strategy for uh, not only implementing the Paris Agreement, but also uh, the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals. And the EU uh, was lacking such a strategic approach uh, by that time. Um, since then, uh, or let's say, so the, the, the aim of the European Green Deal is to, to uh, achieve structural change towards sustainability within the EU, but also to be uh, to give a push to international processes to ensure that other countries follow. And I think um, the most immediate uh, uh, um, success which has been um, achieved there in terms of climate policy is the announcement by the Chinese um, head of state uh, Xi Jinping uh, to to achieve carbon neutrality by uh, 2060 and, and go beyond um, the, the, the national contributions which China had uh, submitted to the COP uh, until now. Um, and in that sense, for the perspective, from the perspective of the Global South, it's also important to see that the European Commission said uh, the Green Deal should be at the center of its uh, renewed partnership with Africa uh, and with the African Union. It should uh, be the basis for having green um, alliances with countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Asia and the Pacific. So renew its international cooperation with these groups of countries. Uh, it should also be part of their co cooperation with the neighborhood of the European Union in uh, Eastern Europe and in the South. So Northern Africa and Middle East. Um, 
and it will also uh, uh, um, form the basis of um, uh, European states in the G20 and their talks on emission reductions um, there. And the G20, as you know, um, is not only gathering the major economies from the old West, uh, so to say, but also um, uh, large uh, emerging economies from um, all other continents. And together they, they cover 80% of everything, 80% of world's population, 80% of world's GDP, 80% of world's emissions and other environmental um, uh, problems, so to say. So now, Obviously, the corona pandemic has changed things, uh, and massively in the EU too, because it's here where countries and societies really have big problems in, in, in containing uh, the pandemic, more problems than, than Asian countries, for example, or, or African countries, it seems. So um, what the EU did then was to connect um, the European Green Deal with its uh, COVID-19 recovery investments, and it expects uh, uh, countries uh, which have been hit by the pandemic and which uh, need this solidarity by other European Union members to connect their uh, in, uh, recovery measures and investment projects with implementing uh, the European Green. And that is a positive sign uh, too. Now, um, what, what are the negative aspects or what is the critical approach to the European Green, green Deal? And I, I want to underline, it's a critical approach with the interest of, of protecting the Green Deal and, and really implementing and achieving it. Yeah. So the criticism now is, is to the usual dynamics, which we always see. The European Commission makes a proposal and then member states aren't um, satisfied. And what we can observe is that member states are more interested in, in, in um, reducing uh, financial um, uh, engagement by the Commission as such, so so the, the um, reduced spending and um, and uh, focusing on on changes within Europe and um, reducing spending for international cooperation. That's negative because the European single market is the largest uh, uh, market uh, uh, of the world and. Uh, it is very likely that uh, if the, um, the European Union makes advances in, in greening its production and consumption, this has effects on global value chains and this has effects on the competitiveness of European products uh, with um, other countries where these uh, green change processes are not uh, so uh, advanced, which means that um, the European Union might adopt carbon adjustment measures at its borders which then could negatively affect uh, exports, especially from developing countries where um, no such public and private resources are available for, for this green, a, a swift green restructuring. So the European Union has to make sure that it's the measures it's, uh, it adopts to protect its own greening uh, strategy does not go to the detriment of least developed countries or low income countries. Um, so it should exempt those countries from such carbon border adjustments. Um, on the other hand, uh, of course, these greening measures also attached to imports, uh, they can be a support for a green transformation in exporting countries. But for making, for ensuring this, the EU also has to make sure that it doesn't only talk about these requirements, but also have a, put controls efficient control and effective controls in place to make sure that um, its imports, for example, from Latin America do not contribute to deforestation, but help to, to avoid it. Um, that's one point. And the other point is that um, member states are, not all member states are sharing the urge of the European Commission in, in transforming towards sustainability. We have seen this in the very lukewarm approach to, to reforms of the uh, common agricultural policy, which certainly are not sufficient for making food systems uh, sustainable. So all in all, I think that uh, the e European Green Deal started uh, as a big promise, but now seeing its um, steps which are being taken for, for implementing it, for adopting it in the first place, it's not still not being adopted uh, as the European Parliament is also making more requests on making it sharper. 
uh, it's really important that negative spillovers of the European Green Deal for developing countries are avoided. And on the other hand, positive spillovers, stimulating spillover effects that help developing countries transform their economies, the two are strengthened. So this is, again, we are in this dynamic between uh, the Commission and the Council and member states and I hope that we um, that those countries which have heavily invested in the Paris Agreement and in the 2030 Agenda keep the momentum up and find a constructive solution for the adoption process. Thanks. Thanks so much, Imre Scholz, for this view, your insights, and also give us a balanced uh, assessment of actually also where the critical areas uh, are. I would like to pass the, uh, what is it, the microphone or the Zoom window over to Rukia now to, uh, to Kenya, and would be really interested in what is actually your perspective on this. This is probably not the first new deal or new initiative uh, that you've seen, and, uh, and you have your own experiences around it there. What is the atmosphere? What is the vibes uh, from the Global South towards? This. Is this something for real? Are there real hopes in it? Or is that something where you look at it very, very cautiously? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doug. Uh, this is, is a very interesting conversation. And thank you, Emma Schultz, for your comments on it. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to say that the, the Green Deal is surely very ambitious. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that part. Um, and also bring forth that Africa as a continent is among us the least contributors to the greenhouse gas emissions globally um, and least contributor to the climate change crisis. Uh, but also acknowledging that our continents are not silos at the moment. Um, I think the pandemic unfortunately has kind of bring that, brought that um, kind of perspective to light how although we're a thousand miles away, whatever affects one continent can affect us all. And this is where we're at. And this comes to something as this policy, this green, green Deal policy that's coming up. How does this impact Africa as a continent and also the global south as, uh, as a region? Um, so uh, when I'm thinking about just like, let's start with just trade, because this is also going to be affecting a lot of, um, a lot of what uh, the fossil fuel industry is, the biggest contributor to to, to the climate change crisis, uh, to the climate crisis, sorry. Um, and all this also comes in with trade and economics of it. So the largest export and import partner for Africa is the EU. Um, and we need to acknowledge that how does that affect our, like our trade uh, and how do we uh, work with each other. Um, and, and to be honest, like the, I like the parts around the, the, uh, around the trade agreements and the par uh, par partnerships and strategic partnerships with Africa and other continents on the global south, um, trying to uh, embed this into the just transition angle. Um, what I can say is uh, we will, th there should be resistance expect expected to this uh, Green Deal. I think the US did the Green New Deal, now the EU is bringing up the Green Deal, which is, is good, but curious to see like how much consultation was it done with these African uh, partners or these African country partners uh, for that Green Deal before it was passed as something that should be taken up? Um, and then also, to since we're expecting that the African country, the continent will come, will be part of the bandwagon, but a large part of some of the countries are still dependent on fossil fuels and are still not into the circular economy um, perspective. And this is where... Uh, organizers, and, organizers and campaigners as myself are coming in to try and bring the narrative around the just transition, just recovery, but it's still being, it's a very long way to that. Uh, for example, uh, Nigeria right now, we're running like a campaign around the Call Free Nigeria campaign, but we are acknowledging that we won't get Nigeria from stopping to use coal at this moment. All the least we can do is try to maybe uh, reduce the amount of licenses that go into coal, uh, uh, pro uh, allowing mines and coal plants to be set up in, in Nigeria and start from stopping new investments, but not, and then go into stopping the current ones that are existing. So coming down to, to Kenya uh, with the decolonized movement around the coal plant, which was supposed to be set up in a World Heritage site like Lamu, um, you know, this is something that the government is pushing for really quickly and really uh, strongly, but how does that like affect like 
not only trade, but also just like the conversations around in Kenya as well. So this is something that's happening. It's, it's amazing that there's this ambition from outside the continent. But for us in Africa, we're really trying as much as we can to really build that momentum from the inside out. So pushing, like what Emma, uh, Emma Schultz said about the Paris Agreement, like that's the government, the, the governing kind of principle we are using right now. And all our governments are having this vision 2030 around that. And that's like our main priority. How can we achieve uh, as much as we can before the 2030? Ghana's trying to get to 30% RE by 2030. Um, and also like Nigeria's trying to stop new coal plants. Kenya's trying to stop coal plants from happening in their countries. So this is, there's so much happening in Africa. So this is just another new policy that I need to think about, another new strategic partnership they need to think about as well. And then for campaigning or organizing, now we're thinking, how can we use the Green Deal to help us, to support us um, in pushing the agenda around just recovery and just transition? Um, and so far, whenever we use, in the continent, we use policies from the, from the international perspective. We're normally told, are you guys have been paid by the international communities to come speak around these things, you know? Uh, or we'll be told, ah, you guys are anti-development. Um, Europe, uh, uh, US have developed because of coal plants and coal mines uh, and oil and gas. Now, why are you coming in to tell us Africa, we can't take that up, you know? That's the kind of narrative that's the kind of feedback we get as campaigners on, in Africa when we bring these issues forward. So it's ambitious yet it's a great step forward since uh, the global north is the highest contributor to the to the greenhouse gas emission. So obviously we're looking to say, yeah, this is happening in the in the global north. How can we how can we use that to 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 really bring that narrative narrative down to the African countries as well? Um, and I guess in terms of um, stop, like when I say stopping or just mitigating the, or just stopping the fossil fuel infrastructures happening in Africa, the one thing that has been helpful is using finance and economy in terms of the in narrative, because <laughs> no people in the economic want to hear, oh, it will save the environment. They're like, how is it going to help our pockets? So they don't care about the environment, to be honest. So, um, when banks like the uh, European Investment Bank came up and said they're going to be funding also circular, invest, circular economy uh, investments, that was like a really good thing for the African continent because now we, we could say, okay, you guys are pushing for fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel uh, 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 projects and whatnot, but the people who actually have developed from that are actually stepping out. So why us as Africa with diverse biodiversity, diverse culture, um, still pushing for this narrative so yes 100 percent it's a good it's a good initiative from 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 uh from the from europe and maybe the best way and i'm thinking speaking around the implementation perspective that emma schultz brought up it's a big issue we always have these amazing policies but we never implement them so how can we really implement them and make them work for everyone and it seems like we really have to have a tough hand to make sure that everyone's on board to come in and we were thinking around just like the Kyoto Protocol, you know, having protocols like that. What if we made such deals into protocols that anyone who signed on to such spaces have to really stop uh, producing or funding fossil fuel in, uh, industries in their countries? So maybe that could help in implementation to really force their hand to really pick people over profit because as the as the years go, it seems like profit is fast and people are second, and we really need to change that narrative. So yeah, thank you, Doc. Thanks so much, Rukia, for sharing those perspectives. Yeah, seeing it's really with a good intention and it might be a really good thing. But again, it's a lot of things are actually there, but then the big step is actually going for implementation. And I'm sure we will come back to that point uh, during our discussion part around it there. The second big part that you mentioned, Rukia, is actually how it's being framed and what kind of narrative is created around it there and how people are being put in boxes or how they're being labeled around it there. And, uh, and I think that's something uh, probably Sven is very familiar with uh, as well. What are your takes uh, on this before we coming back to an overall discussion? Yeah, thank you. Good morning again to all the NISI um, participants whom I unfortunately cannot see, but you know, I hope there are a lot of those out there interested. Uh, good morning from Berlin. Thank you, Dirk, for the introduction. And in particular, thank you, Rukia and Imme for the very thorough uh, presentation analysis, actually, of what the Green Deal uh, is and could mean. 
Um, Dirk, you mentioned it, you know, the, the question really is, is this a top policy level uh, decision that will never, you know, trickle down into reality? Or is there something more to that? And I, I would briefly zoom back, basically, fittingly on Zoom, uh, to where we were in 2019, early 2019, and to show how remarkable that this Green Deal actually is. We at the Clean Energy Wire have been covering energy transition stories for the last six years, daily, every day, you know, you get our newsletter. And in the run-up to the EU election in 2019, the big question was, would the populist right capture Europe? And would they basically wreck the basis for what some would call progressive policies and then you know we got a sort of mini uh, green wave as some have called it in the election we got a surprising you know setup of the parliament we got a totally unexpected president of the eu commission and we got i would say a totally unexpected green deal and and i would stress how remarkable that is um given the the expectations that or the, the fears that were around before um and now we get a deal that has not only relatively ambitious uh, climate goals uh, enshrined or will enshrine them, it has a social component, it has components of fair transition, it, it tries to achieve EU leadership, also take on responsibility. I think Rukia was very right in mentioning that, that you know, the, the, the global north, uh, as it's called, has a responsibility as the, the part of the world that has driven climate change. For so long so all this is enshrined now in this package um that is really remarkable and it does trickle down uh, to, the, to the the member states i would strike this positive note before i come to all these things that might be difficult also the public uh, um, opinion and public perception sphere because you have now countries that you know maybe two years ago would not have talked about exiting coal are now putting uh, coal exits uh, on the table. I'm thinking of Poland now. I know that you know climate campaigners would always say it's too late, it's too little, it's you know it's only words, but it's remarkable that shift. And I think this Green Deal package, you know, basically enshrines a lot of that. And why did it happen? It did happen because there is a broad change in uh, public awareness, at least in many European countries, that climate change is really the defining risk for our societies going forward and the question how we handle it uh, will define you know future policies you know and livelihoods in in many places so that's that's the sort of positive background poll after poll shows even now in times of covid that uh, the public is very well aware of the risks uh, that climate change pose and they they basically favor um, uh, more decisive action now comes the second part. What does that mean? And Rukia has mentioned it, and Ime has mentioned it, and it's the same story in the EU always. You know, there is a great top line announcement, a lot of sort of uh, ambition, and then you know we're getting down to the details, and the devil always is in the details, and that's certainly true for the EU. And if you look at the work package that the Green Deal actually is, um, you know it. it and, and the discussions that we've seen, and Ima mentioned them, you know, already, where some countries are lukewarm at best about you know, some of the measures. And interestingly, different countries are lukewarm about different things. That makes it always so difficult. Also, although it's also always a chance to um, to get stuff done because you can balance the lukewarmness basically across all policy fields. But you know, that is obviously a, a big issue, and. The thing is, and that brings me back to, to this conference and civic, uh, civic education, also a my job of journalists and media, there's a lot of attention to the top line discussion. You know, leaders meeting, discussing things, setting target, will it be this target, will it be that target? And then it gets to the implementation phase and then it's all national politics again. And, you know, the, 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 the attention sort of like falls off because it's about details, it's about enshrining things in national laws and making them happen on the ground and there are really big things coming up and we've seen that by the way with the uh, agricultural policy you know that that it, it almost you know the decision you know when it came to the details you know Greta Thunberg I think criticized it I think it was a bit uh, harsh on all the media but she, she noted 
quite correctly that there wasn't the scrutiny and the interest that, that probably such a package would uh, have deserved in the media and in the public sphere in the wider sense, and that's not only due to COVID. Um, and there are a lot of very tricky things coming up, and I, I want to refer again to what Rukia said, and I think it's really important. One element, for instance, that's coming up next year is the taxonomy for green finance uh, the EU wants to agree, and, and that is highly technical. It's something that a lot of people have never heard of. It's one of the biggest stories a lot of people have never heard of, because if that's set correctly and right, you know, that could really shift the trillions because that, exactly as Rukia said, will prevent, you know, big investors uh, from investing in unsustainable uh, investments. If it's said correctly, if it's said wrongly, you know, it could do exactly the opposite and, and, and sort of lock in investments for, um, for decades, actually, in unsustainable investments. And you have other elements of the Green Deal, like Emma mentioned it in passing, the carbon adjustment uh, mechanism, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is meant to basically sort of make sure that, you know, if companies in Europe uh, produce stricter uh, climate uh, goals and uh, guidelines on, on carbon emissions, um, that, you know, they don't have an incentive to just go abroad and, and produce then elsewhere to lower standards. Now that sounds always great, um, and and you know if it again you know it could could work well, but if it's that badly, and we know that from other EU policies, it could be a perfect measure for protectionism, where you just lock out every in, uh, import from uh, uh, you know the global south or any other uh, competing country. So that that all requires a lot of scrutiny, and from journalists first of all, but also from the broader public. I mean, we need to stay on these issues. Uh, um, and it's not something you can always blame Brussels on or blame the lobbyists on. I mean, we need to make the contribution and we have to watch uh, what's going on. And actually, the EU, I, I did a little bit of surfing on their website recently. They're not intransparent as some people always claim, at least not the institutions of the EU. You can trickle, get down to the lobbyists. Uh, interventions, uh, at least the formal ones, to their processes and so on, and read what you know. Banana growers from Ecuador think about the carbon border adjustment um, mechanism. That's that there is a lot of things to be to be looked at. So, as I've said, you know, the implementation is key, and and what happens in the in the um, on a, in the Brussels in these negotiations, but then also on the national level, how this will be implemented, that's still a very open question, requires a lot of scrutiny from the media, but also the, the broader public. And I think we have a, a big role to play here. And the third point I wanna make, and now that's always, you know, where, where I feel bad, because this is the sort of like warning sign I wanna hold up. Um, I think it's a remarkable deal. I think there are all the opportunities to turn this into a sort of defining policy package that takes leadership, especially as the US is still not clear whether they will return to some sort of positive uh, attitude towards, towards climate action. Although the populace in, in the US wants that, I mean, the political system doesn't reflect that, obviously. Um, as we just found out again in the in the election, there was no climate election as a wave that 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 you know drove that home. Uh, even if Biden should clinch that narrow win, um, the third thing I want to mention, and it you know Rukia and and Ima both also touched on this. We are now in a totally different world than in November 2019 when the Green Deal was announced, because we have a pandemic, a global pandemic that is absorbing a lot of attention, rightly so, and a lot of money going forward. And the risk is, and there's been a lot of talk about green recovery, which is good, and it shows that the public really is onto this. Um, I think the, the pure notion that, that we are talking actually about green recovery um, is mostly due to the fact that in many countries, you know, the public in, in Europe now is pretty aware of the climate uh, crisis and the risks to that. However, we are running the risk that, you know, there's a little bit of green paint painted on the recovery packages and they will trump any green deal money, you know, in the short run for sure. And then countries will be very tempted to take the money and do 
measures that lead to a quick economic fix. Now, what is the quick economic fix? It usually is investing in existing infrastructure and in existing companies and existing jobs. Um, you know, the, the longer I, I had a conversation and we are running now a series of web events for, for journalists. I made a conversation with uh, an, uh, an expert from Greece and he said, look, you know, if Greece gets uh, um, money for, for green recovery, that's fine, but we don't have these projects all sitting in the drawer. What you have sitting in the drawer in many uh, uh, departments of the government is infrastructure spending on roads and on, I don't know, you know, harbors and all that. And whether they're going to be green, that's a big issue. And the discussion, you know, how you can force basically, you know, member states to, to, to invest in green um, project uh, if all they really need to do or want to do now is getting their economies off the brink basically after a year or whatever it takes of a pandemic i think that's a big big question out there and a big risk and again will require a lot of attention from the the media on the ground in sort of like conversation with Brussels, but also for the public to stay on that, which is really difficult right now as we are all busy with organizing our lives around lockdowns and, and you know, school closures and, and more potentially fears about job losses and all that. So um, to wrap that up, you know, where, where, where are we? Um, I think there is a great package out there, a remarkable, that has a remarkable potential. There's the usual risks uh, attached to them that in the implementation phase, the global south falls sort of like wayside and you know all the, the, the trust transition elements get downgraded uh, uh, you know, for economic growth reasons. And then there's the exceptional situation that we all don't know how the pandemic will play out, how the public finances will look next year and the year after, and whether that really can, you know, the, the money for a rebuilding the economies can be funneled into sustainable uh, growth or will end up in the sort of lock-in uh, type of investment. Um, and, you know, I can only call on everybody in this conference, you know, this is civic education job thanks par much, galore. <laughs> thanks so much, Sven, for sharing those uh, views uh, with us. Yes, yeah, Sven, again, I've referred from all three, it's a huge potential that we have, but there's also huge risk if we get lost in, 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 in the battle of the details and it's implemented in a way it actually has also the potential to lock in the status quo or all the bad things around it there. I'm sure Emma, in your discussions and in all these circles and councils that you're sitting in, it's nothing new that the member states play a fundamental role and that also the implementation on a detail level is very important. So probably uh, I would like to hear a few more words from you around this dynamic there. Is, will it be the same processes as before or are you actually confident that it will be, uh, that it will be really taken up and, and how you see the, the current uh, possibilities there uh, and it, will there be urgency and relevance for those topics in, in most of the member states. And then I would like to hear from Rukia afterwards again, from your perspective, you mentioned this inside out momentum building around it there. It's nice to have that outside opportunity around it there, but what are you doing it from your own community levels around it there? What kind of tools or mechanisms would really in enable and empower your communities to actually go and, 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 and take initiative and actually drive it forward. And then in particular, looking at our audience, we would be really interested in to see what role and what kind of contribution could educators and civic education and all other spaces and the artists and the cultural uh, creators actually provide to this, because it won't be the facts that will drive this debate forward. It's about bringing it closer to the people, make it, it makes people experience this and make it their own story. So, but let's first hear from, from Imma, how do you see the dynamic with the member states and uh, having a top line that is great, but then losing the battle on the details? Well, um, I cannot uh, make a run through, through the, um, all the, member, the 20 plus member states. Um, and I don't know uh, enough, but it is clear that uh, there are many, many differences between member states. Yeah. So, um, uh, it, so the, the, I think the advantage of, of the um, European Green Deal and the um, recovery package and this, this combination between, between the two is that it, is, um, it allows for special, for adjusted national strategies. Yeah, and what the the EU promises is that 
it it sets aside it sets aside funding for a specific uh, projects which combine recovery with infrastructural investment for for example now that means also that uh, this frees resources in your national budgets for um, other expenditure which the EU does not subsidize direct support directly but indirectly because any funding you get from outside we know that for from development cooperation is uh, increases the fungibility of your other resources which you already have in your public budgets yeah so of course you need to have projects prepared that's true yeah uh, but you you need to do that anyway because all european countries have nationally determined contributions to implementing the paris agreement so so there is no way around that uh, but I agree that the preparedness across the EU probably is is different is um, um, heterogeneous. Now um, this uh, dynamic, uh, what I think is important um, is to distinguish um, differences in implementation or um, yeah in implementation which are linked to differences in national conditions and differences in political uh, will. Yeah. And um, and I think that is where the political process also centers on, uh, and what what our government, the German government, needs to have very clear, so that it's it the, the the conversations and and compromises it engages in at European level promote political will and acknowledge uh, national differences. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that this is all going into the wrong direction. I was very di disappointed and colleagues at the Council of, of Sustainable Development were uh, disappointed um, at what we, at the agreement on the common agricultural policy. That is clearly insufficient. And I, I don't know enough for um, knowing when will there be the next political opportunity for for uh, looking at that, probably, I mean, the first two years, uh, for the next two years are uh, supposed to be transition years for, for making the, um, the um, agricultural subsidies contribute more effectively to, to greening the food system and the production uh, of it. Uh, and probably that should be closely monitored so that after two, uh, one and a half years, we can prepare for it. Uh, taking stock debate and seeing whether what has been uh, decided is sufficient. So, so to keep momentum on that, and the same applies to to um, the climate uh, implement, uh, the implementation of the nationally determined contributions. So, I hope we see uh, a next climate COP. I mean, it has been decided next year, and that will be an important moment. Thanks so much, uh, Emma. And uh, you, you mentioned one point about all the differences, the cultural differences between the different member states and that everybody actually needs to understand and accept and embrace those diversities. And that usually leads directly also to the role of educators on building those bridges and a pan-European network like NISI of actually going to provide that awareness, that common understanding and building bridges and not uh, bringing people further apart. So it will be really interesting when our community starts discussing in all the workshops later on today, if you can actually make a contribution towards this. Um, Rukia, before we come to the audience uh, fed questions uh, there, I would like to get your view around uh, um, what kind of mechanisms can you see or what would be really helpful from, from your community perspective, from a grassroots perspective, uh, in, in terms to really use this as an op opportunity, as a wonderful potential, and uh, yeah, what would really be helpful from you to drive that inside out momentum building? Uh, thank you so much, Doc. Um, so yeah, I guess right now in the continent, uh, and I think across the world, we've been seeing that the youth have been taking such a huge forefront uh, in bringing change to the world. Uh, and before we were expecting most of uh, people in power and policy to be really uh, at the forefront of putting our interest. Uh, but I'm seeing like the youth are the people right now who are best uh, equipped to occupy spaces and bravely speak forth on conversations that are, might be uncomfortable. Uh, in some in, in some instances, um, so in the country right now, there's like a huge hunger for for fossil fuel uh, production, uh, investment. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Uganda, and Tanzania with a huge East African crude oil pipeline that's going to be set up right now. Um, 
And what has been helping us uh, a lot uh, in terms of campaigning and organizing on the ground is using um, just different tactics to bring these conversations forward. And civic education and creating awareness has been a very important tool because this means that everyone is at the same level uh, knowing the same information. Because um, I think like once you, once the community members and people on the grassroots have the information, they're able to fight for themselves and they get support from the international community. And that's the best way that it should be. Um, most time people expect that the international community can come help the groups do their work, but actually the group, the, the grassroots need to be at the forefront, leading the way and all of us supporting that movement and that, uh, and that conversation around um, building uh, sustainable energy uh, and communities that are resilient uh, in, uh, for long and uh, for long and future terms. Um, then there's the issue of 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 security that has been um, very rampant in for climate and environmental defenders across the continent and I think globally. I mean, even the global south. I think Latin America, Africa, where a grassroots communities are putting themselves forth to to really speak up against these huge corporations, whether it's like Total or I don't know, like uh, Rio Zim that are putting up these coal and oil gas projects. Um, what has been helpful is making sure that we are providing uh, civic education in terms of trainings and how to speak in these issues in, in a nice way. But also one thing that has been helping is using the finance angle. Because when we use the finance angle, we don't, and using targets outside our continent, it's kind of been like a, an umbrella over those communities. Because um, if we, for example, for the East African crude oil pipeline, when the campaigners are saying, total, don't put um, the East African crude oil pipeline in our country, it's not directly saying uh, President Magufuli or uh, President um, Museveni do not put the, coal, uh, the East African crude oil pipeline in our country, which will be more detrimental to the climate defenders if they are targeting the presidents than if they're targeting Total or those international committees outside our space. So that's put up like a good umbrella. And finance tactics like getting big investors like the European Investment Bank or getting like groups like the Afri Africa Development Bank uh, saying they're shifting from, uh, from financing fossil fuels has really been giving power to these communities saying, if the people who are giving you money are stepping out, then it's making our fight even easier on the ground to make sure that we're able to really, uh, what is the word, have more power to really win this, um, these, uh, um, sorry, I've lost my words, <laughs> to really win this, this war around just fossil fuel uh, uh, infrastructure in the, in the communities. So I think like, like you said, and this is why I, I really like, I was honored to be part of this conversation, like, we all need to just have information and be educated around these issues, and it impacts all of us in some way, one way or another, somehow. Um, yeah, thank you, Doc. Thanks so much, Rukia. I, I really like the way how you look at it, and uh, and and it's so important. It's like like what we mentioned before: the devil is in the detail. And when you mention it's about the financial mechanisms that needs understanding, and where we can really use the the potential from it there. But it's also very complicated, a very technical matter around it there. And how can we prepare civic societies for actually being able to engage on a level field with all the other sides, who probably has a lot of very specialized people working working on this around it. Yeah? How, what, what can be done from educators, from journalists, from everybody to actually enable but make the mechanisms transparent and visible and, and actually empower civic communities and actually to engage this debate on a level playing field? Perhaps Sven, would you have a, an answer? I mean, your profession is making information uh, available and accessible to journalists, but perhaps also to wider audiences around. What is really needed now to, to enable and empower communities to really engage in that debate? Well, that that is a good question, and I would hope that your conference actually uh, provides a lot of fresh ideas on this, and the people out there uh, who work on this subject every day. I mean, we try uh, through our for for German audience through our project Klimafakten Day to give people an idea how to you know I mean, first of all, a fact base on what's actually you know climate change how it you know, how it affects us and, and what is actually going on, but also, you know, the tools and the ideas um, how to to speak to others. And it's, it's really important that you understand, and Rukia has, has pointed it out repeatedly, that you understand the mechanisms and, and, and the dynamics that really shape 
a particular issue. Um, you, you mentioned finance uh, several times here. Um, and there is, I think there is unfortunately no shortcut uh, and there are different roles to be played. Uh, I think for, for journalists, the media is really keeping the spotlight on the issue that really matters and the issues that are really relevant. Um, now, this already is a big ask because obviously in a, in a, in a time and age where, you know, every morsel of information is blasted out of proportion through social media to, to stay sort of like focused on the on the, the stories that really matter um, is a challenge for, for any journalist and in particular uh, for media that are under pressure in many countries for financial reasons and in many countries for uh, political reasons actually. Um, let's not forget that environmental journalism is one of the most dangerous forms of journalism in many countries. Um, so, you know, the, the media and journalists have, you know, the, the obligation to, to first of all, figure out what really matters and then keep the spotlight on that and the Green Deal and, and what's going on there in the, then on a national level as well is a prime example for that. Now for the wider public, again, there, there are different, different ways of approaching that. Obviously, Rukia also has mentioned several times now um, the, the sort of, engagement of you know um people who you know really uh, you know are into the issue and tries to find ways of, of you know speaking to to their to their communities to their audiences and the civil society has a much bigger role to play i think on on the, the key defining issues um and that brings in education and you know being uh, you know you, you need to build up that capacity in civil society but everywhere actually in society um to to look uh, into these these issues is there an easy way no i mean am i hopeful that we still you know develop these tools yes because you know the awareness that the fridays for future movement has created um on top of a very good, strong, solid research community. Um, they've not for nothing pointed to the science uh, um, uh, in, in, in basically all their, their messages, provides a good sort of like ground for, for civic education to take these, the awareness that has been built by the campaigners and the, the solid um, research that's out there already um, to create um, information offers for for the wider public there and on schools and, and universities. I think that's a different a different story altogether. Again, probably something where we're more can happen on on sustainability. But you know, it's certainly nothing that you're going to fix in a sort of like with a flick of a of a switch. Um, you know, you need to the awareness now is there, and now it's a good moment actually to build on that and and talk to people and then find out. You know what's their concern and then you listen to them and then you you sort of try to adjust um you know the the the, the core elements of what is ma uh, relevant and what matters to their level of understanding and their interests also i think you know it doesn't have to be boring um, engaging with the people is uh, is yesterday we've heard from the the people in the art and cultural space around it that they see three broad functions from it there one was around documentation and creating awareness creating transparency the second one is to provide pressure a spotlight and disrupt the status quo and then the third one was about translating it into a new narrative into a new normal into a new paradigm around it embedding it in the institutions and i think what i'm hearing from you is really is is the invitation to all of our participants in the workshops later on as well to really see what we can contribute on all those different levels there in order to provide that first of all common understanding awareness and get that sense of urgency through a spotlight and building the pressure but then also working on the solutions around it there and it will be all for us together uh, coming forward. Um, I would like to come to the questions being asked by the audience and the top one is one towards Rukia and uh, Imme and it's a, it's a tough one. Before the EU starts with the Green New Deal, should it actually not immediately stop all the detrimental exports of waste and excess production of meat? Quite a specific question. Any views on that or is that difficult to answer? Rukia, do you want to start? I can start and I can go after you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You want me to start, right? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I think um, this um, excess production of meat, for example, that is uh, obviously um, a matter of, of metrics. Uh, and but but uh, I, I assume that what you mean is this. Um, uh, meat production at large scale, which with 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 net negative effects on how you how you treat um, the animals and and the imports of, of fodder and and all that's uh, that's connected um, with with meat production and um, and and placing the the um, European Union as an exporter of agricultural products. And I think that the expectation actually we had on we as a Council of Sustainable Development of the uh, European Common Agricultural Policy was uh, exactly to, to um, strengthen environmental criteria and which would then be a clear incentive uh, and also a clear um, regulatory incentive for, for reducing uh, meat production. I mean, in Germany, we have these meat producing uh, areas in North uh, Germany where we have serious problems with nitrate pollution of groundwater. And that is already against uh, European law. Yeah, and, and Germany is breaking that. And uh, so, so that clearly um, uh, has to stop. And waste uh, production, I, I understood that the, the initiative of the European Commission on Plastics is exactly um, uh, uh, aiming at that because they want to um, tax uh, non-recyclable plastic production that will affect package. I mean, the, uh, that will affect package um, and and non-recycling of package, so of, of uh, waste package packaging, and then uh, that should have an effect on on uh, uh, reducing. Uh, um, waste, plastic waste, and and uh, but I don't, I'm not sure whether they also want to directly um, aim at at waste export. Yeah, I, I'm sure that what they are aiming at is to reduce waste. Uh, and when you look at the at the communication on or at the strategy on circular economy, uh, it's it uh, it looks explicitly at packaging and it looks explicitly at plastics. So um, I think that this is clearly on, on mind of the, uh, of the European Commission. And it has to be followed up by member states, obviously. Thanks a lot, Emma. Any views on it, uh, Rukia, before we come to the next question? Yeah, I think Emma covered like the whole thing. I uh, wouldn't want to add anything more, but I think I'll just like try to like go back to what uh, uh, Emma mentioned at the beginning of the conference when she talked around how um, just specific objectives around social uh, dimension of social sustain, uh, sustainable of sustainable development haven't been really touched on specifically in the in the Green New Deal. And I guess I think like this is a big it's 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 big in terms of. Yes, there's just recovery, yes, just circular economy, but specificity in what aspects of the circular economy they want to touch on will be will be a good thing to add on to into the strategic like um uh policies or documents of the Green New Deal. In terms of um ways towards to the continents, uh yeah, most definitely there's a lot of dumping that's been happening uh, to the African continent, not only from Europe, but even recently now, the U.S. was trying to, to sign like a trade deal with, 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 the, with our country, Kenya, around um, having to export plastics into the country. Uh, and just if you know that Kenya does, has, like a, like, has a policy of like ban plastic or single-use plastic in the country. We do not use any single-use plastics in the country. So this trade deal was kind of like a big wake-up call to the, to the communities on the ground. So dumping is an issue that's been happening for, for a couple, a lot of years in, for Africa, whether from China or whatever people don't use in their, in their continents normally comes into our countries and we sell them in the markets and whatnot. So this is an issue, issue that, yes, it's something we need to tackle. And like we said earlier, it's all about implementation and just step-by-step -step consultation with all the partners that are involved to make sure that this comes to fruition. 
Great. Thanks so much, Rukia. The so next question is uh, directed to all of you, and it's about what are your concrete suggestions um, for the role of civic education to actually handle all those multiple crises that are going on at the moment? Yeah, we've got COVID, we've got climate, we've got a polarization of societies, <laughs> and we probably it's just a matter of time before the next crisis hits around it there. What actually is needed to build that resilience in societies uh, to actually be able to cope with those multiple big inputs yeah, that are, drives that competition for funds and, uh, and all the other different uh, uh, areas. Any viewpoints? Mm -hmm. Who would yeah. like to go first? I, I, I have a very short uh, um, idea for that. I think we should, we should uh, um, civic education needs to uh, explain why we speak about crisis, but a focus on, on attractive futures is very important for motivating. I think you, you need um, positive ideas about how the future, a changed, a different future should look like or could look like, so that uh, we know why we engage. We do not only engage to, to avoid crisis. This is a negative neg narrative. I think that is very important. What, do we, what uh, do we not want to lose? Yeah, But also, what do we have to gain? What is uh, what? What makes life attractive when when uh, structures are reformed and when I think that is also an important function of of uh, this type of education. Thanks very much, Emma. Any views from Rukia or from Sven? Yeah, I just want to first of all, I think I totally agree with uh, with Emma on that. I would have said, you know, let's inform the the broader public about solutions and not just about the problems uh, that that's how i would put it but that that's an important uh, element the other element is you know i think make a clear distinction and help people to understand where they personally can seriously make a difference and where it's actually not necessarily their job. So this is a two elements because too often we're like, oh, how can I save the climate? Well, yeah, that is one element, but you need to also need to understand what political dynamics are much more important. And Rukia mentioned the fossil fuel industry, for instance. Um, if you don't use plastic bags, you made a positive contribution, but the big deal is not your plastic bag. And that is something that civic education sometimes gets a bit too much into the sort of like, oh, how can I in my personal life, which is an important element of empowering people, but it needs to be put in perspective. Otherwise, you end up with the sort of like these tiny little things and, and polls showing that people think that to save the climate, we have to give up plastic bags, um, which is, you know, <laughs> interesting, but not certainly not the fix. Thanks a lot, Sven. Any views from you, Rukia, on this topic? I'll just have to say plus plus. Uh, Emma and Sven covered <laughs> that yeah. perfectly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and again, I think it also was uh, was the topic of yesterday's discussion between Maya Goepel and, uh, and and Grace, where they really said it's not about what we're losing, it's actually about what can we gain, what can actually is a purpose for us, and what is actually good enough, what is sufficient for us going into the future in order to give people a clear perspective. The next question is coming from uh, Katrin, uh, who asked, uh, many companies stress that politicians are actually more reluctant to reform ecologically than they are. And she puts as a reference the climate uh, climate conference uh, by the Spiegel or the Boston Consulting Group on November 3. How to fix that? That actually the corporate sector is now running ahead and politicians are trailing behind. Is that a true perspective or is there actually some truth in it? Mm. Emma? Yeah. I mean, um, it really depends on who you ask in the corporate sector, obviously. But I think that it is important to note that the corporate sector is not uniform. It's, uh, there are many companies who are building their case on, on explicitly on a green narrative, so to say, or on a green uh, um, uh, idea. Uh, but there are other, and, and that I think is a significant change. There are other companies who started, uh, who are CO2 intensive and who want to survive and who know we need to engage now in, in, in changing our, uh, those parts of our production uh, system that, that are so CO2 incentive, intensive. But for that, we need to have a clear idea 
what is the time frame, what is the ambition, and let's be more ambitious now, because otherwise we will we'll maintain this lock into uh, carbon in intensive production um, processes and and I think these are growing and um, uh, and there the perception is that it has not this change is not yet clear to all those in in politics and in parliaments who think they still have to defend economic interests and these interests are changing I think that is important yeah thanks a lot Emma anyone of the other to, to comment on this if I can, one addition to what Imma just said, I, I completely agree. It always depends on who you ask and, and what their perspective is. I think companies, you know, in, in the way they're run, you know, they, we don't have to always understand them as an ethical institution, which is good if they are, but, you know, actually, the, the, you know, that's not the, the drivers usually. They adjust to what their customers want, what the frameworks are. Obviously, they try to influence, you know, politics so the frameworks are good for them. Um, but this is an interplay. What what I would say, and in response to this question, um, <laughs> politicians, you know, obviously have to answer a question that companies don't. Companies will tell you what they need as a framework to shift from doing something carbon intensive to something low carbon. And that usually uh, entails regulation that's in their favor and money. Um, and the politician has to answer the question, who's going to pay for that? And that is obviously making the politician's job a little bit harder than sometimes in a, in a business to say, well, you know, we're going to shift if you subsidize new steel making technologies, if you set a framework that is conducive to that, um, and if you save our jobs. So there, I, I would always say it's like, yes, I think there is a genuine shift in many companies to understand that you know, the, the, the new production methods will be probably low carbon, um, but they want a certain framework for that. And they obviously don't want to, you know, pay from their from their shareholders account. Um, and, and, you know, that makes their job slightly easier in arguing for uh, policies <clears throat> that will help them than for politicians in democracies, at least, that have to, uh, to, to go to their voters and say, OK, we're going to subsidize carbon, low carbon steel making, or we're going to replace all coal fired power plants with renewables and, and have to invest in that. So that that I think is what, at least one explanation why sometimes politicians look, you know, more cautious these days uh, on, on ambition on climate than, than businesses. Yeah, and it shows that some corporate uh, actually see a huge benefit of actually creating a narrative and building their case around it. Yeah. Let's see how this dynamic works out. Unfortunately, our time is running up. We have many more interesting questions, so we try to feed them uh, into the different workshops again that are happening soon. I would like to give each of you just one short final statement in terms of what is your wish, your guidance for the rest of our day and tomorrow uh, for the conference, and already a big, big, big thank you for your wonderful contributions and sharing your insights. Um, Imma, would you like to sh start with a short uh, final statement or a wish for the audience? You are... We, we can't hear... He oh, right now, now I hear your voice, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, thank you for, for this um, uh, opportunity to, to actually listen to Rukia and, and also Swen. That, that was very helpful for me also. I would have liked to learn more about African climate and coal debate, actually. Um, uh, as an, but, but I think uh, to have this as a starting point for, for a discussion on what is the role now about public civic education, I, I think this is great. I hope it was helpful for the audience too. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ime, for joining us. Rukia. Uh, thank you, Doc. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll echo Emma's uh, uh, comment around. It was a pleasure to really have a chance to be in this panel with Emma and Sven. I learned quite a lot. Uh, and just like recently, when the last question you guys asked was really bringing me to um, around the issue around debt in our countries. Uh, like in Africa, some of our countries have carried so much debt. And sometimes that puts leverage on the people who, on the creditors to make us take up investments that don't make sense in our countries. And I guess um, deals like this means that we have, we're in a position to 
be with investors that are really going to be pushing the narrative around just transition and just recovery. Um, and yeah, I, I'm excited about the ongoing conferences that are coming up. And I love the fact that you brought up uh, aspects around artists and how they bring the change to the world. It's amazing how you can just do a mural or <laughs> do a song and it can bring such heavy messaging and make it very light for every single person to understand. And I guess that's a very key part about civic education, making that uh, that text or that conversation palatable to everyone who's gonna be taking it in. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much for joining us, Rutia. And Sven, final words. Well, thank you, first of all, Dirk, for the opportunity, and Imma and Rukia for the really interesting and, 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 and um, important insights, actually. And it just hammered home for me something that I, that I feel particularly strongly about is that, you know, for these big issues, we need to think uh, across borders. We need to think in, in, in the interconnections, the interplay of international um, politics, policies, but also, you know, the relations between people. And that's probably where the civic education part comes in, because, um, you know, civic education should focus on these relevant interconnections as much as they do on what's going on locally and, and you know, take these perspectives in and, you know, make it fun, make it interesting, make it relevant to to ordinary uh, ordinary to everybody basically um and i think if if the the conference can can come up with interesting ways to do that i think that's a that's a great first step and then we need to keep going and then you know there's all reasons to be hopeful just go and do it. Wonderful. Thanks so much to all of you. You're more than welcome to join any of our breakout sessions later on during the day and tomorrow. And I pass it over to Tanya to actually lead us into the next step. Thank you, Dirk. That was a hugely powerful uh, launch to the day, I would say. And we're about to, as Dirk said himself, move now into the parallel sessions. There will be a short interval. This means that the sessions begin at 11.15. There is a selection to choose from. There will be three panel discussions and three workshops. It's uh, the details and the links can be found on Housespace to each of these events. Um, I'm just going to very briefly run through the list for you. Uh, the first panel discussion, what are the right answers to COVID-19 and climate change? That will be looking at similarities and differences. The second panel discussion is about China's moment in world politics or a new Cold War in the making. The third session is a workshop and is from the European or based on European youth work and citizenship education for diverse target groups. The fourth session also workshop, what does national identity mean in our present time? The final workshop in this group of sessions is the creative approaches to new democracy and the final session in this parallel round is again a panel discussion, the unusual suspects, what is really going on in Europe's so-called civic deserts. So I will close here to give everybody a moment to uh, find their links, to log on to where they would like to be and wish you a hugely productive day. I look forward to seeing you again shortly or later today.
So, welcome everybody to our panel on COVID-19 and uh, climate change. My name is uh, Ralph Fuchs. I'm the director of the Center for Liberal Modernity, a Berlin-based think tank dealing with uh, the renewal of uh, liberal democracy and the challenges we are facing among them climate change, finding liberal answers to uh, these uh, challenges and dealing with the authoritarian threat from um, within and from authoritarian powers uh, which are meanwhile competing with liberal democracies like uh, China also in terms of uh, climate change or how to deal with COVID-19. Um, In the short time, in the short term, COVID-19 seems to be the more urgent and uh, traumatic challenge we are we are facing. But uh, behind the p pandemic, there's another, maybe even um, more dangerous uh, crisis looming. If global warming will spiral out of control, it will threaten the livelihood of uh, billions of people, affecting every aspect of our life agriculture, water, biodiversity, health, migration, um, also international relations and geopolitics. Interestingly, COVID-19 as well as uh, climate change are fueling uh, a very strong public and political impact of scientific findings and science-based policies. So follow the science uh, seems to be um, becoming more and more um, a kind of political um, guideline. Um, but at the same time, uh, COVID-19 as, as well as uh, climate change is strengthening a tendency uh, towards strong government, um, strengthening the dominance of um, governments over parliaments and, and uh, even over the public deliberation. Um, so this is a, a very interesting similar uh, the parallel between both crises. Um, and compared to COVID-19, uh, climate change seems to be a much more complex challenge. Uh, there is not a single root cause like a virus uh, but a, multi a multitude of sources of greenhouse gases uh, from agriculture, our energy system, um, car traffic, aviation, shipping, uh, key industries uh, like uh, chemistry. Uh, so um, greenhouse gases causing global warming are deeply inscripted um, in the fossil fuel driven industrial system and uh, modern lifestyles. So how can we effectively stop global warming or at least keep it significantly below two uh, degrees uh, Celsius, which seems to be um, an ultimate uh, critical threshold uh, to, to keep uh, global warming under, under control? Is it about self-restriction? Uh, uh, shrinking uh, our consumptions, um, restricting our mobility, um, or restriction by government, slowing down the economy, uh, reducing um, transport, uh, bringing tourism down to almost zero, which we are facing now in the context of uh, the corona crisis. Is it about governance uh, by strict rules, um, limiting uh, basic rights like freedom of mobility, uh, private entrepreneurship, and cutting down social life to, to a minimum? Is this a, a, a role model for fighting climate change? Or is it the other way around? Does the transition towards climate neutral, uh, neutrality require more economic dynamics, more innovation and large-scale 
investment in order to uh, reconstruct our energy and transport system, to rebuild our cities and uh, key young industries. So do we need more control and command? Or is there an alternative pathway towards sustainability in line with liberal values, plurality of lifestyles and um, individual liberties? This is more or less the overarching uh, framework of our today's uh, discussion. Um, I am now uh, briefly introducing uh, our panelists. Um, and I'll start uh, with welcoming Hannah Lübert, uh, who is with me here on the uh, stage in uh, Berlin. Um, she's a member of the Youth Council of uh, the Generation Foundation and co-author of You Don't Have a, a Clue, That's Why We Have to Step In. Welcome, Hannah. Um, at home, uh, so only virtually, um, then with us, um, I will start with Carolina Vigura from Cultura Liberalna um, from Warsaw. Uh, and the, she's also a member of the advisory board of uh, NECA and a good friend um, and uh, a bright intellectual. Welcome, uh, Carolina. Um, the you. next one, Viviane Radatz, uh, she is a senior policy advisor uh, on climate and energy uh, for the WWF uh, in, in, in Germany with a lot of uh, knowledge and experience in environmental uh, policies. And last not least, uh, Michael Jakob. He is senior researcher at the Mercator, uh, Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change, one of the outstanding German uh, think tanks uh, dealing with the issues we are, we are talking about uh, today. So I would like to, to invite Hannah to then open the debate with some thoughts on um, the parallelities and differences between COVID-19 and climate change. And if you see any, I would say, opportunity uh, in the, the current quite bleak situation uh, we are in, how ca can we get out, uh, how can we change uh, threat into the opportunities? Yeah, first of all, oh, can you hear me all? Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, well, when this crisis began about half a year ago, um, I heard a lot of people talking about it as like a big chance, maybe the chance that we need to overcome and tackle the global climate crisis. And at first, it kind of seemed like they were right, because we saw emissions drop globally uh, by about 4 to 5 percent which is actually the largest drop that we have seen in human history and which is a larger reduction in emissions that we have uh, achieved by any kinds of climate policies so far. But I think that uh, the longer this crisis has endured, the more it became clear that this is not the whole story. And um, if we look more closely, then we can see, or then we have to ask ourselves the question, at whose expenses do those drops in emission occur at the moment? And in case of the lockdown and the re restrictions due to Corona, unfortunately, the people that are suffering the most from it are the ones who are the most vulnerable in our society anyways. Like for example, people in risk groups, elderly people, chronically ill people are dying and people are losing their jobs and losing their means of existence. Um, and those are often the people who are um, the poorest off anyways. So. I think that in this way, this is actually the opposite of the kind of climate action that we need. The real kind of climate policy that I am pushing for, that my generation has been pushing for for months now, is, is our policies that can uh, protect the means of livelihoods for future generations while also protecting and establishing social justice within the current society and within the current uh, generations. So this is the first point. And the second point, which I think is maybe even more important, is that these kinds of emission reductions that we have seen due to Corona are not the ones that are gonna to, uh, going to save our climate in the long term. Because in order to be able to stay within the 1.5 um, degrees limit, 
We need to constantly and coherently drop our emissions until they final, finally reach a point of carbon neutrality. But um, the, the reductions that we have seen so far are only because of a temporary halt to global economy. And as soon as the economy will, will keep going, the emissions are going to grow again. And um, for example, in the last financial crisis, crisis, we have seen that once the um, economy um, kept going again, the emissions grew even faster than before. So um, we are now at the exact same point in time where we are facing a huge danger of these so-called rebound effects. And um, I was kind of hopeful for the past months that these stimulus packages that needed to be passed by governments in order to like, uh, stimulate the economy and uh, make it recover would actually use this potential, this, this point in time where the economy comes to an hold to, to rethink the very way that we business works and to, to trigger this innovation, this transformation to renewable energy that we need. But um, if we look at what has happened actually here in Germany but also globally, I feel like my hope, the hopes of my generations have kind of been disappointed because most stimulus packages that have been passed were actually um, means of um, generating economic boom as soon as possible while delaying this kind of transformation that we need. I think this becomes especially clear if we look at, for example, the fact that um, globally, if you look at all the money that has um, gone into stimulus packages, twice as much money has gone to the fossil fuel industry and the conventional industry than to renewable and sustainable ways of um, businesses. So to kind of end on a positive note, and because I'm a big fan of staying hopeful anyways, I think there are um, two main chances that remain for the future going forward. One of them is that now that we have the new lockdown and businesses need to pause and uh, come to an hold, probably new stimulus packages will be needed. And if we push enough and make our voices heard um, from the climate and social justice movement, maybe this time the, the packages will be actual, actual you know, um, yeah, investments into our future. But I think this will not happen um, by itself, but only if enough people push for it. And this is uh, where I see the second chance. Because since the climate crisis and the corona crisis share some similarities, especially that they show us as, uh, that we are vulnerable, that we are not invincible as humanity, that nature can be dangerous if we push it too hard, and that we need to prevent crises in order to protect human lives. Maybe more people are going to wake up to the immense danger of, of climate change and will start to get active, start to get organized in order to, to tackle this emergency. But I think um, what this all comes down to actually is the fact that nothing ever is a chance in itself. It is only a chance if we decide to make it one and if we decide to take it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Um, next one, maybe Michael uh, Jacob. Um, so uh, where do you see these structural sim similarities and differences between um, the corona crisis and uh, then global warming and um, so where are the the um, maybe catalytic points we, we we can make use of um, to uh, turn this crisis into kind of a uh, better future yeah thank you very much um, to start, I would like to say I agree with many things that just have been said, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, regarding the similarities between COVID-19 and climate change, I think the two most important similarities are first, um, that both are some kind of problem of collective action, that you need people to cooperate. Um, second, it's about making large-scale changes to society, to our economic activity, to actually the way we are doing things. And as you've seen, change has happened very quickly, many aspects of our lives, the way we treat each other, this social distancing, wearing masks, home office, and so on. Many things have gone tremendously quickly. But what's the big difference to climate change? I think the most important difference is that climate change is sometimes called psychologically distant. That means 
the most important impacts of climate change will not be felt by ourselves, will not be felt by our friends and families, but will be felt by people living in the future, by people living in countries far away. And our societies are not really made up, we don't have this moral compass to think in this very long-term, very cosmopolitan perspective. And that makes it much harder actually to deal with climate change than dealing with COVID-19. Um, regarding the changes we've seen, I think there are some hopeful signs. So, for instance, mobility has changed. More people are using bikes, more people are staying at home. Transport emissions are falling. Um, we see some green aspects of stimulus packages, which could actually help to steer um, energy systems in the right direction to actually incite, incentivize energy system transformations. Also, what I very much appreciate, as you mentioned in the beginning, that we have more trust in science, that science really has been singled out as a trustworthy source of information, of actually guidance for social action. And I also think it's important that at least we have a strong feeling of we are into this together. We have some kind of solidarity. We have to care for each other, for other people even though it doesn't extend beyond borders and beyond generations so far. On the other hand, um, there are also some really worrisome developments, like for instance, more people are using the car now. Um, we don't have, uh, trans public transport is declining and this might actually lock in behavioral patterns for a long time that people um, don't actually appreciate public transport anymore. Also, if you look at stimulus packages, um, even though coal has been phased out or is on the way of, uh, out in many countries, other countries, for instance, China, have actually pledged to bring back coal plants that have already been decommissioned in order to stimulate the economy. And this could actually lock in um, carbon intensive infrastructure for decades if these coal plants are really built. And in the long term, um, I'd also be concerned about the social and political consequences. So think about unemployment. If many people now lose their jobs, actually, there might be this discussion. We cannot afford greenery in such a, a, a um, situation. We now have to help people to have employment if we cannot afford climate policy. So this is something um, I'm really worried about. And I think we now have to steer the discussion in the right direction. And as has already been said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. We now have an opportunity to steer economic developments, social developments, political developments in the right direction. But this really requires some proactive stance from our side. This really um, demands taking the right decisions. Thanks so a lot, Michael. Vianne Radetz. Um, we will talk um, on the European Green Deal, I think, in the next round of our conversation. But um, Maybe um, you could reflect a little bit on the policy answers up to now. Um, interestingly, and I guess this is a more promising sign, as uh, also Hannah was quite critical about the concrete packages which had been uh, decided by, by the European Union and uh, the national governments. Um, that the, the policy answer to the economic recession, which has been uh, caused by, by, by COVID-19, the decline of uh, our, our economies was, we have to use this as an opportunity uh, to renew than our, our e economies. So it's not just about um, let's uh, uh, continue um, uh, business as usual. No, it's. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the the message is already there uh, that we have to reconstruct our our economies in a, in a different way coming out of this crisis. So, what do you think about it? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I agree with very many things that were already said um, by um, the last two speakers. I would like to stress, though, on the 
on what we have seen in short term reductions in the past, that's really that's absolutely not sustainable. And um, it's something that I think in the it showed us in a way that we can change a lot very quickly, as uh, Michael Jacob also said. But we also need to um, take this forward in a more constructive way. And for me, for if, if you ask me about the chances out of the COVID crisis, also for um, climate mitigation, I had two things that are more encouraging and I have two things that I think are more the caveats that we really have to work on now and one of the things uh, that I found more encouraging was actually the way um, recovery packages were set up because it's not because they are perfect they are very far from perfect and they are also uh, still maintaining the status quo as to the fossil world but we've seen some movement um, in these recovery packages um, that or at least for Germany, we have like 30 to 40 percent that you can um, assess goes into climate infrastructure, uh, especially in transforming industry and all these things that haven't been tackled so far. So for me, this is encouraging. And I would like to pick one thing out for Germany that I find is a real game changer. And this is not handing out bailouts to internal combustion engines um, within the recovery package. And we have seen that this is making a change, a very big change, because the uh, sales of combustion engines are so far not coming back while electric vehicles are soaring um, in, in sales. So this is only one aspect and it's really not enough, but for Germany, this makes me, it's, it's, I find it encouraging because it, it also shows that even in a car country like Germany, we can have this switch. We can actually um, get into other gears, basically. The other thing that I found encouraging over the last months was actually that the climate policies were not falling off the agenda. It was a big fear in the beginning that now everything will be COVID and nobody will drive any kind of climate policies. And it hasn't actually materialized. Um, we, we've, we've had a lot of effort on the Green Deal, on the climate law um, within the European Union. I will stress that none of this is enough to actually fulfill the Paris targets or to um, securely reach climate neutrality at a point uh, where we need it. But it is not off the, it has not fallen off the agenda and it's very much um, in all political um, um, processes. So on the caveat side though, what has not actually made the agenda is that we need early action. This is also something that's so similar to COVID that the, the earlier you act, um, you get uh, the better the results you get and you ha really have to pull through. And we, we, we saw this with COVID in the first uh, um, lockdown period. And now we're already much more skeptical um, about um, shutting down public life, even though we have actually much higher infection rates than we had in the spring. Um, you are actually there in a, in, in, in a public uh, arena, basically. Um, and this is the same with climate, just uh, a lot less visible. The effects are not visible now, and we don't go into these early action things. We've, we've seen policies, we've seen it in the recovery packages, but what we're not seeing is actual policies on the ground that, that pick this up, that pick up the spirit from the recovery packages and that pick up um, the spirit that's somehow there, that climate policy is needed. And that's for me a real big caveat because what we're now facing is in the next 10 years is Action is everything. So we need to basically do everything we can and not talk about so much, uh, you know, about the whole narratives and stuff. And the other thing that's for me a caveat, I know I'm a bit over the time, I'm sorry, um, is the cooperation that's needed and to take the people along. I think this has been a, a, a you can see also with COVID that it has been much easier in the first uh, phase in spring to actually um, get people to be on board. Um, it's much uh, much more difficult now to bring people along on this, uh, you know, to cooperate and this whole solidarity and um, creativeness thing that we saw in the spring for this lockdown is basically gone. And I think this is also for climate. Um, this is a very a serious message. We really need to have other ways to co um, to communicate and to cooperate to make all the action that's needed happen. And that's for me a big thing that's not been addressed so far. And we see big rifts. I'm not talking about what's keeping us all on the edge of our seats with the US elections, but there you see the rifts that we also see here that people are just not, or, or that it's hard or it seems harder to bring people on board. I stop there.
Thanks a lot, Viviana, and also thank you for reminding us to the elephant in the room, uh, the still pending U.S. elections, uh, and, and the outcome, of course, will also have a, a very heavy impact on uh, the global governance on, on, on climate change, yes or no. Um, so, Carolina Vigura, um, maybe in addition uh, to what you, you anyway wanted uh, uh, to, to, to say, you can reflect a little bit um, on, uh, I would say, the shift in the um, relationship uh, between um, strong government um, as uh, the, the 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 actor of in in, in the, the the crisis, you know, this uh, crisis are the hours of the executive, um, the branches of of our governments, um, and what of course is a basic quality of liberal democracies than public deliberation and and uh, the whole thinking about alternatives yeah we 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 tend now more and more there is no alternative uh, the famous margaret thatcher uh, saying from the uh, 90s um so there's no alternative uh, than to to deal with covid 19 in in a certain way or to deal with climate change in a, in a in a certain way and science is telling us what we have to do so uh, what do you think about these kind of uh, tensions rising um, thank you very much ralph at, and at the same time uh, thank you for having me i'm really delighted to be here I do have some logistic problems here because my five years old uh, son is a little bit nervous. So uh, please let me help him per first and then I will speak because otherwise it will not be possible. Uh, just give me, give me 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds, okay? This is home office. The reality of home office of uh, working mums. <laughs> And That's dance. why you need a couple more screens than the one you're on. Yeah. <laughs> so, Carolina, would you like to wait a moment or can you step in? Okay, we're all set to go. We can try. At least we can try. And I hope uh, it will be possible. So thank you very much, Ralph, for this question. So actually, it's exactly what I wanted to start with, because I do believe that the question, the initial question of this debate, at least of this first round, uh, namely, will the COVID uh, crisis become a catalyzator for change, uh, brings me to speaking about three paradoxes, and strong government is one of them. Uh, but I will start with, with another uh, paradox, if you, if you allow, and then I will come back to, to, to strong government or authoritarianism, or, or as, you, as you like to, to call it. So, um, you, you probably are aware of the film of Jean-Pierre Jeunet, uh, which is called The Very Long Engagement. Uh, one of the first scenes of this movie is a scene when the main heroine is, um, uh, is chasing a car in which her fiancé is taken away to the First World War. And she is uh, running after the car and crossing the spiral road on which the car is, is moving away. And she says, if I am able to chase the car, I will see him again. Then you have the whole film and the whole plot. And I won't spoil too much when I say that in the very end, she, her expectations are met and not met at the very same time. So it's a very important philosophical question about what, ex, what, what expectations are and how they are fulfilled by reality. And I do believe that what we are facing when we're uh, talking about the COVID-19 as being a catalyzator for a good change in climate saving, this is a, a, exactly the paradox of, of, um, of expectations. So what we will uh, receive actually after this crisis will meet and not meet our expectations at the same time. And the reason for this is that 
politics uh, of states uh, during the COVID-19 crisis is very similar to, uh, to actually curing the patients. Namely, if there are any diseases that are accompanying COVID-19, you know very well, uh, those patients are doing worse than others. And exactly the same happens with the states. So, so, so of course, some states will work on their democracy, will work on, on changing this, this, this drop in CO2 emissions, for example, because the crisis has shown something very important, but others will not. Because in, in fact, the, the COVID-19 is a catalyzator, it, indeed it is, but it is a catalyzator of the reality that we have had on already before. So in those countries where the discussion about climate was already strong and already vital, probably this discussion will continue in a very uh, fruitful way. But in other countries where um, the work to be done was avoided by many political strategies, for example, by illiberal populist strategies, I, I'm afraid the, the, the COVID-19 will be catalyst catalyzator of something else and not necessarily of good outcomes. So this is the first paradox, the paradox of, of, of expectations. The second, ex the, the second paradox is, is, is the paradox of expecting that uh, um, um, a simultaneous crisis would bring something good, would transfer some knowledge from fighting with pandemic to fighting with the climate change. But I do believe uh, we should be very realistic here. Namely, those two crises are simultaneous. This is true, of course. But apart from this, this fact that they are both happening at the same time and that they are telling us something about how vulnerable our presence here on Earth is, we actually cannot uh, have very many other common characteristics. So, for example, science knows quite a lot about the climate change, but actually science doesn't know too much about COVID-19. Uh, as for the climate change, I do believe that there are already some solutions that are known, but as for the COVID-19, we actually don't, do not have either a cure uh, neither a cure nor a vaccine. So, um, so, 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 this is important that we that we are aware of that. And also, uh, what what um, what what my predecessor, pr pr previous panelists, have been uh, mentioning. Of course, there was some drop in the CO2 emissions uh, globally in the first wave of the pandemic. But we are already aware of the fact that it's not. Uh, it's not so so uh, so simple anymore because, for example, as Michael has said, more people are using cars. So this is um, uh, the second paradox, the paradox of the two simultaneous um, uh, crises. And the third paradox is exactly the, the paradox of the strong government. So um, we, we have seen uh, through the last eight months that those governments that are more democratic and more liberal uh, are actually dealing with the pandemic better than those governments uh, which wanted to appear to be very strong or even uh, displayed an authoritarian streak. So we have observed, for example, uh, you mentioned Ralph um, Donald Trump. Donald Trump does display an authoritarian streak, but the pandemic uh, has been a deep, deep crisis and perhaps even a national health disaster in the US. And the same could be said about uh, my country. So um, the government that has been presenting itself as a strong government, as a government to quote, that can do things in comparison to the former governments that were unable to perform projects and were saying all the times, all the time we cannot do it, we, can, we cannot do it. Actually, those governments, which appear to be strong and perhaps even authoritarian, they do not uh, cope with the pandemic well. So what does it actually tell us, uh, this paradox of authoritarian uh, uh, um, uh, governments or strong governments? It actually tells us that to fight the pandemic and perhaps also to fight the climate change, we need not less democracy, but more democracy. 
not less liberalism, but more liberalism. And that we need also new role figures, role models of politicians that are able to, to bring cooperation uh, without displaying this uh, authoritarian streak, because it simply doesn't work. Thank you. We'll come back to <clears throat> this uh, question, I think, in the final round of the, our discussions, if uh, and how the liberal democracies can successfully compete with authoritarian uh, regimes in dealing um, or limiting climate change and turning, transforming our economies. Um, I would maybe, uh, Carolina, uh, just a, a short uh, question. Uh, doubt a little bit your assessment that liberal democracies up to now had been more successful in dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, if you're looking to uh, Switzerland, to Spain, to uh, France, a lot of other countries now uh, on the top, and, and Europe in general as a continent now is on, on, on the top of uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, wave. Um, I would say, uh, and, and if you're looking to China, which uh, then, um, seemingly, I'm not sure about uh, the reality on the ground in China, but seemingly had been able to uh, cope much more effective with uh, COVID-19 uh, than we. Um, populist regimes have failed. Yeah, populist regimes like uh, Trump in the US or Bolsonaro and, 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 and others. But I still think we are in a deep competition, a kind of systemic competition uh, between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes also in terms of um, uh, fighting COVID-19. What do you think? Um, so uh, um, I, I hope I, I um, express myself clearly. Yes, this is exactly what I wanted to say. Illiberal populism has failed in, in coping with, uh, with the pandemic. Whereas um, uh, some authoritarian regimes like China are, de are, are dealing uh, quite, quite well. Um, but I, I, I also wanted to, to ask uh, a question which should be perhaps with us without uh, answering it uh, immediately. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, uh, fighting with, uh, with the uh, pandemic uh, in a state is similar to a fighting of the COVID-19 in an in a individual patient. It means that if there are coexisting uh, diseases, uh, the, 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 the disease of COVID-19 will be more severe. And I do believe you can see it uh, also in liberal democracies like France, which has this radical polarization and also um, uh, quite a few conflicts in the public uh, sphere. And uh, here I would see the reason for which France is not coping very well. But the question is actually, is the number of cases the only way you assume whether the pandemic has been dealt with effectively and successfully or not. Because uh, we might say that uh, the, the number of cases is of course extremely important, but in the long term also social cohesion, social trust and solidarity are extremely important. So you can imagine societies which are suffering a higher a number of COVID cases right now, but in which social cohesion, solidarity, and trust are at bigger levels. So we should rather have perhaps a more rich assessment of what uh, successful dealing with pandemic actually is. Thanks a lot. Are there comments from our panelists on this uh, topic? Anyone? If Hannah? 
debate around whether or not climate action means that we have to do some restrictions uh, to our liberal democracy. I'm 100% on Carolina's side here but, um, when she said that climate action means that we need more democracy and not less. And I think um, the reason we're now in a state in, in, in terms of the climate crisis where we need action that is so sudden and so strong that some people are wondering whether or not democracies can carry it out is only because we, we missed the last 40 years to act. We've known what's going on for the last 40 years and we didn't act. And if we're looking at why this happened, uh, we are seeing, for example, lobbying groups who pushed uh, immensely against climate action. We're seeing that, um, for example, Exxon and other fossil fuel industries um, were, were blocking um, public awareness about this emergency and thereby hindering action. And all those things are, um, are as Carolina said, an, a lack, uh, um, yeah, a sign of a lack of democracy and not the opposite. And therefore, in order to make our democracy future-proof and to, to tackle the, the, the climate emergency within our liberal democracies, I think we need to strengthen our democracy in itself. So we can never see climate action apart from action to, to expand and strengthen our democracy. For example, by having stricter control on lobbying groups or um, by example, uh, for example, by uh, establishing more representation for um, groups of people who have not been represented in the past, for example, the young generation. And I think by doing all this, we can actually strengthen our democracy while also tackling climate change, while also re-establishing re the trust in democracy that is so, so uh, deeply needed in order to make our democracies resilient even in times of crises that are coming. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to, to raise the question if um, this issue, if climate change finally um, needs to, to, to strengthen our democracies, liberal democracies, and, and can't be better dealt with in the framework of liberal democracy with uh, pluralism and public deliberation um, and the, the um, uh, debate on alternatives uh, then by authoritarian top-down regimes. Doesn't this uh, also uh, depend from the way we are thinking um, of the ecological transition. Um, is it more about restriction, restricting uh, consumption, restricting the production, a kind of control and command uh, system, a detailed regulation of, um, let's say, a, a production and uh, uh, our way of uh, living? Or is it more about Let's say innovation. Is it about inventing, reinventing the industrial uh, society? So, what is the, let's say, the, 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 the relationship or the tension between uh, sufficiency, uh, efficiency, and innovation in, when we are thinking about um, moving towards uh, climate neutrality? Michael or um, Viviane, would you like to jump in? Should I start? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very central question. Um, let me start with my take on the strength of liberal democracy. I think the big strength is that you acknowledge diversity, diversity of values, diversity of worldviews, and that you are able to come up with solutions that at least achieve a compromise between different interests, between different views. So this has a very great potential for innovation, not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of social practices that authoritarian regimes might lack. The big drawback of liberal democracy is that it's slow, it takes time to achieve some kind of compromise because you need debate, you need discussions, you need actually a learning process to actually understand what other groups are thinking um, and actually how you could actually design solutions. And there's a kind of tension that's impossible to um, get rid of. But on the other hand, maybe that's exactly what you need because 
even if you had an authoritarian state who would very well address some of these issues, you might have very important drawbacks like throwing baby out in bathwater. So if you think about in China, you can easily build huge amounts of renewable energy um, without even consulting the people who are negatively affected. Just think of the Fruit Gorges project where millions of people have been resettled. Of course, that's maybe a quicker way to deal with climate change, but maybe it's not the way you want to have a society. So as a society, if you talk about restrictions, yes, we need some kind of restrictions, but these restrictions cannot come from a top-down approach, cannot come from a authoritarian regime that tells us what to do. These need to be rules that we as a society give to ourselves. And finally, I think what's very important here is that in order to make democracy work, we need some kind of spirit of community. That it's not only that every group, every person thinks, what can I get for myself, but have some sense of uh, altruism to deal up, uh, to understand that certain rules are valuable, even if you don't benefit from them personally, and that you have this kind of spirit that we as a society are in this together, and we develop rules in terms of boundaries, of uh, resource use, of emissions, and then actually think about what you can do to respect those rules, what kind of regulations, what kind of uh, policies are appropriate to achieve these social targets. Thanks a lot. Viviane? Yeah, if you ask whether it's more about restrictions or more about uh, innovation, then I would say um, it's about both. Necessity is the mother of invention. So th there are certainly areas that need to be restricted, but it's not it's not people that we need to restrict. It's basically our fossil way of life that somehow are the fossil fuels that are flowing into our lives that we need to restrict in a way. But it's uh, it's very clear to me also that all the solutions we have on the table, they have come out of liberal democracies. Maybe you can develop something, not maybe, definitely you can develop something better in, in a liberal um, state where, where there's diversity, where there's creativity, where everybody can, uh, you know, try something. Um, maybe then China can basically um, deploy renewables faster at some point, but we've seen all the solutions so far that have come from from diverse and creative societies. So, um, but still they come if there are some restrictions or if there are some values that um, people see that they want to address. So the whole energy transition, all the energy technology or renewable technology comes from people that want that had the idea that the, um, this way, a fossil way of life had to be changed and they start experimenting and then things come out. So I think we definitely need both the restriction of the fossil world, basically, that we've been um, totally, as you said in the beginning, Ralph, that we've totally intertwined with that all our way of life is completely based on how, how, how fossil fuels and uh, fossil energy um, are coming into our societies. So that needs to be restricted in a way, and that also leads to innovation and invention that we need. And but we have lots of, of like lots of this innovation we already have. There's lots more that we need. But the thing is, though, you also need the people to, as uh, Michael said, to have this feeling of community. You need people that want to creatively engage with the future. It's not about from uh, in Germany the discussion is often about accepting renewables or something like that. So it shouldn't be about acceptance, because acceptance is more like a stage of mourning or something. It should be about creating the future world together and that's what people need to have the freedom to engage in so i think liberal democracies are definitely more equipped for this thanks a lot i would like to pick up a question from our audience um, related to to our last uh, conversation um, i'm quoting the lack of long-term imagination has been a key problem all along, but do you think people's emotional responses to scientific predictions could be altered by COVID? Maybe I would um, reframe it a little bit. How can we turn fear of the future into the confidence that we will, ab will be able to, to shape the future and create a better future? 
than instead of this thinking that, that we have to um, uh, go back uh, into, into a kind of imaginated uh, past. So uh, this is an emotional thing. It's not only about the narrative. Uh, then it's about, uh, as, you, as you said, Viviane, uh, it's not just accepting the, the necess uh, necessities, uh, but, but creating some kind of um, um, aspiration that we can do better. How can we do this? Maybe I'll, I'll just begin. I think there's a couple of factors that need to be fulfilled in order for people to not despair by a challenge or by a problem, but to be confident to tackle it. And the first one is we need to be aware of the pro problem and we need to understand it. And this has worked quite well with uh, COVID. I mean, at the beginning, we didn't know anything about it. And we, uh, like the science made really quickly a lot of progress in understanding it, but even more so, um, I think that the communication to the public about this problem has worked quite well, which is a big difference to uh, climate change communication. Because um, we've also heard in the beginning, um, someone said previously that um, Corona is much more visible than climate change and this makes climate change more easy to deny. But if we really think about it, COVID is in a way invisible too. We don't see the germs, we don't see what's going on in peop inside of people's lungs if they die from COVID. But this thing has been made visible by the media, by um, seeing it every day on TV, by people addressing it, by people not stopping to talk about it. And we need the exact same thing for climate ch change. And this, this can be possible if we have a different take on it, for example, in the media. So this is the first thing. Then the second thing is people need to be aware of the, of the alternatives to the current state and here too there's a lot of ideas there's a lot of very very inspiring alternatives to our current way of living to our current way of economy and i think part of the reason why people have been um or at least part of a lot of people have been inspired by this uh, first wave of corona was because they saw that everything could be so different and we need more communication so that people don't think that our current capitalism and the climate change uh, cl climate crisis are inevitable but that everything could be different but this also is a an, an task for media for um, politicians for public communication and then the third thing is that people need to see how they personally can make a difference, how they have power to influence the whole change that they want to uh, see going on. And I think that is something that, for example, Fridays for Future and other movements have achieved quite well because they gave people an opportunity to engage. And I think if these three factors are met, then we have um, more confidence than despair in, in the face of crises. Okay, thanks. I would like to pick up an, another question. Um, with all the money spent to fight COVID-19, is there still money, energy, political agreement and motivation left to fight climate change? Uh, maybe we can focus for a moment on the economic aspect of the, the, the question. I think there's a clear um, contradiction uh, now emerging um, between the, the economic recession uh, caused by, by COVID-19 um, and the need uh, for accelerated then investment, for more investment, both private investment by, by enterprises, by companies and public investment for uh, renewing our then transport system, investing in public transport, um, in electrification of uh, then mobility, um, speeding up uh, uh, renewable energies, um, redesigning uh, energy intensive industries like the chemical or the steel industries. This is all about huge amount of investment and at the same time uh, the, the, the economic power of governments and of companies uh, is uh, shrinking as the result of the crisis. How can we uh, than escape this uh, trap. Any ideas? Maybe Michael? Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, actually, I think there's not such a big trade-off between fighting the economic recession and doing something as, against climate change. Because now, due to COVID-19, markets in a 
disequilibrium. And this requires actually some kind of state intervention anyway. So you need to spend money now to actually keep the economy going, to keep people in employment and so on. And actually many things very would like to invest now, which actually have been shown to have large multiplier effect, I mean, a large stimulating effect on the economy, um, such as infrastructure investments, are also investments that are very crucial for climate change. So for instance, this would be a very good opportunity to spend money on public transport, on upgrading rail infrastructure, on upgrading electricity grids, on investments in R&D. And actually, there has been very, very recently been a poll among uh, many economists led by some very famous people, such as Joe Stiglitz, Nick Stern. Um, and they asked them which um, measures they actually would recommend in terms of greenery and in terms of um, addressing COVID-19. And actually, they have identified a lot of options that would actually fare very, very well on both accounts. So I'd really encourage you to take a look at this study. Thanks. Another question and a concrete idea, a concrete proposal. I wish there could be an R rating every day on climate change dynamics, like on COVID-19 dynamics, regulating our daily life and maybe steering uh, the political action. Could that be possible? So, so what could be um, say kind of... Um, public uh, indicators um, which could raise awareness and um, uh, could guide uh, the policy, uh, policy the decisions uh, with respect to, to, to climate change. Perhaps I'll pick this up because I'm very interested in, in uh, this question and also the question that was previously about future and fear. Uh, namely, it's very important now to understand that uh, people uh, in our societies, in my country, but also in your countries, uh, live in a, in a profound state of fear. And fear um, produces rage. I do believe that uh, the example of my country recently is exactly uh, the, makes exactly the point. Uh, you have all probably seen the, uh, the photos, the pictures, the films uh, from the protests uh, in, uh, in, in defense of women's rights, uh, rights in Poland. 100,000 people protesting in Warsaw, 400,000 people protesting all over Poland uh, in, on Friday, on last Friday. This has been, this have been the biggest, the largest protest we have had in the free Poland after 1989. And I do believe this has something very much in common with the COVID-19 pandemic. Namely, people would probably protest anyway, but the state of fear they are in produced even more rage at the decision of the constitutional tribunal regarding abortion. So um, what, I, what I would like to stress is that this is a profound challenge for the politicians because if we talk about future and fear in the past decades, we might say just after the Second World War, um, fear was connected with the past. So people didn't want the past to come back. The future seemed to be an open book in which we were to write. Then after 1989, still so, but um, a rising fear of the future appeared. Um, future being the end of the world that we know it. And actually, if illiberal populists won so many elections around the globe in the past few years, it is exactly because they were projecting and expressing this fear of the future, the fear of the world that is ending, the culture that's ending, the societies as we know them that are ending. And now COVID-19 um, is, is, is an extremely important pandemic because it brings fear of having no future. We cannot even plan ahead for two months, four months, because we really don't know what is going to happen. And I do believe that this is a challenge for politicians, because if we are talking about uh, efficiency uh, and, and, uh, and, and fighting climate change, it's very important, in my opinion, to, um, to, that, that, that there are politicians and there are civic uh, leaders that are able not to uh, 
only show uh, drastic numbers about the future. So not only all the time uh, cause fear about the future, what is going to happen, but also produce a picture, a vision of the future, which is a positive one, which brings hope. If we only uh, scare the, the citizens, the voters, with the visions of the future, I do believe it won't, it won't simply work. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to um, raise another question from, from our audience. Um, Viviane talked about the need for restriction of uh, fossil fuels, governmental restrictions, policy restrictions, but what about the meat industry? How can governments approach these issues with liberal values? Very interesting question because um, um, our the, the way of eating, of course, has uh, quite a significant impact on, 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 on global warming and maybe this is the area in which individual change of habits, individual change of consumption uh, and, and, and uh, lifestyles uh, can have the biggest uh, than impact. So what is here the um, uh, relationship between governmental regulation and uh, individual um, uh, change of, of, of uh, lifestyle? Maybe I start because I I was addressed. Um, <clears throat> I think, well, for all of these issues that we're facing, individual behavior is has a role. And but it's also um, that we're seeing this also with, with meat, but also with uh, fossils and so on. We see individual behavior going in the direction of change. <clears throat> Sorry, but it's also something that. Um, the incumbents actually wanted us to deal with, like they wanted us to take the whole uh, idea of a personal carbon footprint of doing something uh, as a single person is, has been also very much um, driven by uh, large industry um, and by the big polluters in a way. So yes, we have a role as individuals in this, as in meat eating as well as in uh, driving or not driving, but we also have a role as citizens, as to actually make our voices heard politically, which then drives this much better, I think, than the individual situations. And when it comes to meat uh, consumption and or fossil fuel consumption, I think something that we haven't spoken very much about it, but we've touched a couple of uh, times is, it's basically all these things that are so ingrained in our societies, they have also come in through policies at some point to uh, through favorable policies for them um, that the way we eat, um, the way uh, that meat is very cheap and so on is very much uh, has very much been driven also by policies that favor um, these kinds of production. Uh, the same with fossil fuels. So I think prices, and that's um, an, a very political idea to actually put a price or a real price on things will help very much with it. Other than uh, that's also already many, many people that are already taking up this uh, spirit. So we, we see meat consumption actually going down as well as beer consumption, um, which is so it's vegan mostly. So <laughs> we should maybe drink more beer and eat less meat. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I've, um, Michael, what do you think? Uh, Viviane raised the, the important the issue of pricing, so the internalization of uh, the environmental cost in the, the market mechanism. Uh, how do you see the potential of um, this instrument uh, regarding uh, CO2 uh, pricing, um, uh, cap and trade uh, or CO2 uh, like taxes, but more in general, would you say this is uh, the the instrument of choice uh, that we should prefer against um, this kind of nitty gritty regulation and uh, like control approach? Well, 
I mean, I'm an economist, so I'm very much in favor of market-based in instruments. And I think having a price on uh, having a price on carbon emissions is crucial if you want to address climate change. If you don't get the prices right, it will be very hard to have the right incentives in a market-based economy. On the other hand, um, in many instances, it's not the question either or. So having the prices right is very important, but might not be sufficient in some instances, especially in areas of life that are very much connected to social norms, to social values. So think about food, think about mobility, there's more to it. So we need to get the prices right, but that's not sufficient. So we also need some kind of social change. And I think prices can help, but you also need a debate and need to think, how do we want to live as a society? And you might even have bans on certain things um, if you have a social consensus on this. So think about smoking. There's been a huge change in smoking behavior in the last years that actually has not only been driven by prices, but by actually smoking bans and not smoking bans that have been imposed, but where you had a real majority of people advocating these bans, even smokers that actually didn't like um, smoking inside. And if you talk about, for instance, meat consumption, um, well, this is very much driven by not only the prices, but also to routines, to what are you actually used to, what you think is like normal. So if you grow up eating meat every day and you think it's normal, you might actually need some push to be driven out of it and to learn how it um, should could work in a different way. And um, that's also what I would like to build on what has Hannah, what Hannah has said, that you need positive examples. You need to set examples. How could actually our societies work if they were more sustainable? Not only say we must not do that, we must not do that, but frame it in a, in a positive way. What would be a healthy, wholesome food basket look like? What would healthy, wholesome um, mobility patterns look like? How could we all benefit from it and protect the environment at the same time? Um, thanks. Another question. Is there a chance to avoid that after the corona crisis, people fall back to their old climate damaging habits? So once again, is it about changing habits or is it about uh, changing the way we are producing energy and food and uh, industrial goods, um, if you take mobility, is it about more or less mobility or is it about smart than mobility? So um, Viviana already touched this uh, the issue of privatization of uh, the, the climate challenge, um, changing habits or changing structures and the mode of production. Um, maybe I'll just begin. Anna? Um, I think with regards to this, um, is it more about consuming less or producing differently? This is um, not an either or. We really need both because there's a lot of research also showing scientifically that if we want to manage the transition to renewable production and renewable energy in time to stay uh, within the Paris Agreement and the climate targets, this is only possible if we also reduce consumption at the same time because otherwise uh, nature simply cannot supply the necessary resources that we would need, for example, for um, sustainable traffic or um, yeah, cars that are electrified. Um, so we really need both and if we apply this now to the corona situation and the fact that um, people started, for example, um, driving less, using less mobility, during Corona, but we see that this is um, changing back to the habits before already. Like, for example, right before the lockdown started here in, in Germany a week ago, people were already um, traveling as much as they did before the crisis. So this is really not something that we see happening in the future, but it is already or has been happening that people are going back to their old habits. And um, I think here applies what has been said already that when people make personal choices about their everyday consumption and everyday life, they are always embedded in a kind of policy mix that um, drives them or nudges them to making certain decisions. So um, what we need is not only that people think about it differently and become aware, but also that 
the sustainable alternatives to consumption need to be made more attractive and need to be made cheaper. And that's where we really need policy um, to kick in. And as I said, one way of achieving this would have been by the first stimulus, stimulus package that could have um, strengthened um, renewable production much more than it did. It did in some ways, but I think it wasn't enough. But now, as I said before already, uh, we are probably going to see more recovery packages and more stimulus packages, and there's still, still a slight chance of using this to really transform our economy and transforming our, our way of life. I would like to come back to the idea that um, reducing consumption uh, should be a substantial answer to uh, the environmental crisis. It's not only about climate change, it's about biodiversity, it's about the loss of fertile soil or the water crisis in big uh, regions of the planet. Isn't that, I would say, a little bit provocative and illusionary the idea that uh, the answer to these challenges has to be we have to reduce uh, the, our, our, our consumption if you're looking to um, the global uh, the dynamics. Uh, we are facing uh, an increase in, in uh, world population up to 10 billion people at the midst of the century. We are seeking the rise of billions of people out of poverty to the global middle class. Uh, we are seeing an accelerated urbanization. Uh, the United Nations are, prediction, uh, are predicting that over the next maybe 30 years, uh, the numbers of uh, urban citizens will double, which of course means a lot of construction, a lot of infrastructure, um, a lot of uh, electricity and so on and so forth. So we are living in a growing world. Uh, whatever we do in, 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 in Germany, if, in, if, we, if we reduce our ecological footprint, uh, to, to half, we are living in a grow, growing world, growing production, growing consumption, growing number of people. So isn't the, the, the core challenge, the crucial challenge to decouple economic growth, the production of wealth from environmental consumption, from environmental degradation on a global scale? I would like to take it from here, it's, if it's possible, because uh, it really rings a bell as for uh, my and Ralph's common interests, as for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the meaning of economic growth and consumption in a global scale, and also when you compare uh, different regions one to another. So I, I, I instantly remembered one of the slogans of the Gilets Jaunes, uh, in France uh, that were saying uh, when you are talking about the end of the world we are thinking about the end of the month and I think it's extremely important uh, also uh, it's not a, it's not only about France it's also about my country uh, where if people for example heard that they are expected to consume less and to, to have less economic growth, especially in the economic crisis that has been caused by uh, the COVID-19 crisis then they would say, well, probably we'll then vote for populists because they don't want uh, us to tighten our belts. So it's, it's very important that we think at the same time about saving climate because we know uh, that, that science is one of the biggest achievements of our culture, but at the same time, democracy also is. So we have to save both things, both, uh, things, both achievements at the same time. So I, I do believe it's not actually about uh, less mobility, it's about better mobility. It's not about a less, uh, less meat just like this. It's, about, uh, uh, it's not about no meat, it's about less meat and better produced meat. So, so uh, again, it, it comes down, it boils down to innovation and not restriction. Michael, as an economist, what do you think? Um, is growth in itself the root cause for the environmental crisis or can we change the nature of growth? Well, um, I think the debate has been way too much about growth. So 
it's very clear that our economies as they are are unsustainable. So they cannot continue growing in the same way they did. So if you use even more resources, you generate even more emissions, of course, this will not keep us in line with any kind of environmental integrity. But on the other hand, if you just trick the economies without changing their fundamental structure, this cannot be sufficient. The way off of achieving any kind of climate target, if you just, even if you were able to cut the global economy in half without changing its underlying structure. So what we really need is to have fundamental structural change. And then if you achieve this change, this kind of decoupling that you mentioned, it will be a different economy. And then it's hard to compare it to what we have now. So I would say, don't talk about growth as such, but really talk about the fundamental changes in terms of institutions, of political changes, social challenges that are necessary to achieve a more sustainable economy. And we have actually called this a sustainable sustainability transition. And maybe I would also like to okay. add on one thing that Hannah said. I think we need all the options. So um, if you regard mobility, so instead of taking the plane, you could take the train, you could have a modal shift. You could also just stay at home and do a video conference. This would actually be avoiding the trip itself. Or you could also, if you want to go to a faraway country, take a plane that's running on zero emissions, either through synthetic fuels or even electric planes, whatever you think of. So all these options are on the table and there's not the one option that will do it all. It's a smart combination of all of them. Viviane? Yeah, I would like to <clears throat> come back to this decoupling also, because I think the re reduction of consumption is uh, is not actually reducing comfort and quality of life. Um, so it's it's a it's a different thing to reduce basically um, all the fossil consumption of the transport sector than to reduce mobility, because mobility is still there even if you don't uh, do it on a fossil fuel. You can do it on a bike, you can do it on your own feet or with many other options that we all are developing also. So I think that's very, very crucial in explaining that, that it's not about taking away your mobility. It's just about making it different, but you will still be as mobile and uh, as happy as you have ever been or even happier because you don't even have to go to a gas station anymore. Um, so we can do it that different was the one and thing better. And, we can do it different and better. Yeah, it can actually be better. And I think and I, there's also very many encouraging signs that people are picking up on that. Um, the other thing, because you mentioned also the uh, gilet jaune and these things, what we haven't talked about is that there is, there will be people that are not, you know, benefiting from this transition. And so um, the, the whole uh, item of just transition really we haven't talked about, but there will be trade-offs for many people. And to, in order to make this go in a way that everybody can benefit is, is then to um, have the societies basically um, deal this out with each other. We've seen this with the coal um, phase out that we that this term came up, but we will see it in the future in many other sectors. And I think it's something that we haven't touched upon enough. Um, what about these people that, that actually have to deal with the trade-offs because they, they will be there. And the later we start doing something, the those um, um, blows will be harder. So mm -hmm. we have to kind of mitigate not only, you know, the emissions, but we have to mitigate also all the um, implications it has for many people. And if we don't do that, then the whole thing will fall apart. Um, I would like to bring in another question related to this topic. Um, taking action is a good way, however, how to encounter the anxiety, anxieties of the citizens before the transition due to climate change. So which kind of, I would say, accompanying policies then do we need uh, to reduce the fear of change and uh, to raise the confidence of uh, people um, also working class people that they will not fall victim of these uh, change. Who wants to answer? Carolina? 
I would like to answer if I have the answer. Um, because I suddenly started to think that at the time when we are discussing what could be done, could be done to, to fight uh, climate change in a wise way, and then at the time when, when there is this wise question about uh, how to work with people's anxieties, I suddenly realized that anxiety and fear is actually also a very important political fuel which is used uh, on purpose by some political leaders. And here again, I would like to speak about liberal populists, illiberal populists, who are using this kind of what I call a perverted entertainment, um, causing scandals, divisions, and setting, actually putting fire in order to people be anxious, to be emotional, to choose sides. So um, it is, it is a, a, I believe, a, a global question, not only what we do with people's anxieties, because I do believe um, this is not about policies as, as such. This is about leaders and their competence in being uh, empathetic towards people's anxieties, fears, and frustrations. But it's also about political fights and showing that this kind of uh, liberal democratic vision, which is also a vision of a dignified future in a better uh, a, a, situ a climate situation that we have now uh, in, in, in a, let, let's call it very, very uh, um, realistically a slowdown of the, of the climate change. This would be also already dignified. But, but it's also about convincing the voters that they uh, could vote for this better alternative. Uh, and not only uh, react very emotionally and automatically for those perverted entertainments that are uh, proposed by illiberal pop populists. It's very important that we, that we understand that it's not only about we or politicians contacting the societies, but it's also about an ongoing political fight between illiberal populism and liberal democracy. Yeah, I would add that at the same time it's not only about the kind of language, it's also about concrete then policies, yeah? for instance regional policies or industrial then policies to manage the transition and to reduce the anxieties that the transition will lead into a deep economic and uh, social crisis. So I think the, the, the challenge is that we uh, have to, to transform our uh, in industrial societies um, into a sustainable future without uh, 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 risking collapse. Yeah, because uh, not only the environment, also our societies are very fragile systems, very vulnerable systems. Maybe another question um, directed to Hannah is the Fridays for Future movement the solution for listening to younger voices or do we need a new action plan to start a common dialogue on future challenges? Big question. Yeah, really big and really interesting question also. Um, I think if we're looking at what Fridays for Future has achieved in the last couple of months or years, it has been the solution to parts of the problem, but only parts of the problem. Um, for example, I think that the whole climate issue has been discussed much more broadly in the news and in the public sphere than it would have been otherwise if Fridays for Future hadn't taken to the streets. And um, I think in a way the younger generation has proven that they are able to understand the science, that they are able to understand or think about future challenges and be political and uh, get stuff done, so to speak. And in a way, I can I can feel it, and many other people in my generation feel that like the respect that is brought towards us has grown. We are taken much more seriously, but 
only so in like the public sphere like we are getting invited now to discussions like that the fact that i'm here maybe it would have been uh, would have not been possible before fridays for future but politically we're not seeing the changes that we need at all yet um i think this is very evident if you look at like the climate packages that has been passed last year um by the government which was celebrated as a success but like considering that this was uh, after the biggest protests in German history and considering the fact that it's probably not helping Germany to stay within the Paris targets, it, it's not a success after all. And um, I think that this kind of show, Fridays for Future, shows us as a young generation that the kind of forms of protest that we have used so far are just not enough to apply pressure um, on politics and that we need new ways of getting engaged. And um, I mean, this is part of the reasons why a lot of people from Fighters for Future, for example, now start to um, join parties or start to um, run as a candidate for the um, federal election uh, next year here in Germany, because we are trying to like find um, new ways of not only being um, kind of um, opposition out of parliament and talking about stuff and um, trying to apply pressure but really getting into politics getting some kind of uh, political power to make things happen and um, i think this is what we will be seeing much more in the in the uh, time that's coming and also what i think is needed um, to make the voices of the younger generation be taken seriously and actually being implemented into um, politics is that we and this, this kind of narrative that we have a conflict between generations here, that it's the young generation who are against the old generation because the old generation has like ruined their future. I think this is deeply wrong. I think that older generations can be as anxious about climate change as we are and that we actually have a common interest here to fight against the kind of destruction that we are seeing um, going on. So I think, um, yeah, the new action plan that we need, so to speak, is to like make the generations work together and ending this generation conflict. And maybe creating also new kind of societal and political alliances. I, I see, you know, with a lot of interest that more and more, uh, for instance, trade unions uh, then are uh, moving, uh, they are adopting the, the climate challenge and moving uh, towards green innovation and also uh, the the industries. I'm just coming from a workshop with Martin Brudermüller, the CEO of uh, BISF, the biggest uh, the chemical uh, the company in, in Europe. And they are not only seriously thinking about reconstructing their, their, their company, they are investing billions of euros uh, in uh, more renewable than energies, in changing their feedstock, uh, so sustainable, uh, using sustainable materials, in recycling. So, final question, are you confidential? Do you see these um, developments with a, with a hopeful than I, or um, do you think we, we are losing the race? Please, all the four of you, quick final statement. So, um, if I may adopt the language that we've seen in the US election, I think it's too close to call. So, <laughs> there are many positive developments. And I mean, the EU Green Deal is a big thing. China announced to be um, carbon neutral in 2060. And if Biden gets elected, if we get the US in, we can really create global momentum and really get to where we need to go. But there are, of course, so many obstacles, political obstacles, lobby groups, inertia by people um, unwilling to change their behavior. So I think the door is open, but we really have to walk through it. Yeah, I would say <clears throat> there's really more momentum that I have seen in uh, the last 10, 15 years of doing this job, but also now we need more momentum than we would have needed 10 years ago. So the verdict is still out because the momentum is there. All the frameworks, at least in Europe, a lot of the frameworks are more or less in place. But what we're not seeing is the action. When I come back to my initial statement, it's really about the next five years. If we really get 
all the policy instruments that we need, if we get it on the ground, if we measure and then uh, readjust, then I think the momentum actually goes somewhere. But at the moment, we still have, like the, it's still too close to call. I would also end on that. Carolina? Oh, to... my microphone you... was off. Okay. Uh, um, so, if I were to 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 continue on this uh, note from from the US, I would say, do not stop the vote. Um, it's uh, it, it's important that we understand that we are in the process, and uh, exactly COVID nineteen can teach us here something. Um, we shouldn't actually think about being in post pandemic world because we are in a pandemic world and the same with climate change we are in the challenge and i do believe it's important to realize that because only if we realize that we are in the process we can see the situation that we are in not as only as a threat but also as a challenge for human ingenuity Thanks a lot. Hannah, last sentence. Um, yeah, I feel like this is actually the hardest question of all to answer because <laughs> I'm every day struggling with whether to be hopeful or not. Because on one hand, I see all these really, really disastrous um, consequences of climate change already happening and we have lost a lot already, like the Earth has now already warmed by 1 or 1.3 degrees and we are really, really close to hitting tipping points and all of this is extremely scary. And at the same time, I see things like you just mentioned, those alliances between actors that had not, would have not been possible before happening and um, what, what moves in society at the moment, that gives me hope. And I think what it all comes down to is the fact that there will never be a point in time where we can say now the climate crisis, uh, climate crisis is decided, now we are all doomed and it's over. But everything we do always matters. Every tenth of a degree of warming that we can avoid matters and um, how we even the consequences that are now unavoidable, how we manage them, how we mitigate them, all of this matters. So the fight will never be over and that's why we all have to stay active. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, also referring to the United States, um, I would say with Joe Biden, keep your faith. And with Barack Obama, we, yes, we can. Yeah, I think we have to strengthen this kind of yes, we can spirit that we are able to turn very dangerous challenges into opportunities to create a better future and to, I would say in my words, to kickstart a green revolution. So thank you very much. Uh, take care and all the best. Bye bye.